seven. Welcome everyone to True House Stories. I'm Lenny Fontana, and this week on the hot seat, we have not only a DJ, a man that they would hmm. say coined the expression rare groove, written in storybooks from uh, Jamaican reggae to R&B, dance music. I mean, you name it. He has touched. He was an, a very prolific a r man at one time, which I will ask him about as well and some of the signings that he was involved in too in his story. Um, he's played records for a damn long time. And I mean a long time. Some of you guys are 25, 30. I'm going to say double your ages he's been playing. He's got more than enough experience, and he definitely has the title that was be behoot him as MB. <laughs> I think they call it. Yes, I'm trying, and I, I am so, and I've, I've said this over and over. I'm so jealous. Yeah. I want that MBE name next to my name because I just think it's incredible. We're going to ask him about all that stuff yeah. and what that means to us. But I wanted to introduce you to Mr. Norman J. One of London's true finest diamonds in our in our music industry, and thank you, Lenny. Thank stop, you stop. Me. That's enough, man. <laughs> thank you graciously for taking your time. Just so you know, he doesn't do a lot of interviews, so this was a lot of work, and I'm so glad he decided to say yes. So, everyone, please welcome. Give you a warm applause. He, I know he won't be able to hear it, but give him a warm, mm -hmm. wonderful welcome to Mr. Norman J. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, everybody. So, mm -hmm. as we start off, I always tell everybody share this, of course, but we're past mm -hmm. that now. You've all been sharing it. So, mm -hmm. we all know Norman is Norman J, okay? Mm -hmm. And he's born from a mom and dad, as I always ask the same question. Mm -hmm. But the question is, we start as a young child, and music mm -hmm. is finding you, and you finding music. Can you take us on that journey a little bit, going back to where mm -hmm. it begins for you? Well, from... As long as, you know, my parents um, came from the Caribbean, from Grenada, in the, uh, to England, settled in England in the early 50s. Uh, I was born in the late 50s. Um, from, I can remember we always had music in the house. Um, my dad was a big fan of uh, Nat King Cole in the 50s. My dad loved um, orchestral music. Um, he liked Tijuana jazz, he loved music from South America, Cuba, and obviously music from the Caribbean. Um, long before it was called reggae, the music that came from Jamaica was, was, uh, was like um, a Jamaican version of rhythm and blues and, and, and jazz. Um, hence it was called um, ska, uh, and then blue beat. And it was, that was the music that connected uh, my parents and family to home in, 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 the, in the Caribbean. But at the same time, we loved a lot of the big American giants. You know, I can be, I can remember, you know, even as a child being exposed to the, uh, the great Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Big Maybell, um, and the kind of the birth of, of, of Motown. Um, and it, and as a young child, it, it just held me spellbound, um, me, and, me and my brother. Um, we always had music in the house. And I think when I was about four or five years old, my dad bought a secondhand piano um, with the hope of encouraging my brother, Joey, and myself um, to play it. We never did. We never went anywhere near it. We were interested in his record player, the radiogram. Um, and uh, my dad bought a top of the range. He... It, it took him, you know, I think you call it lay, lay away in the States. Um, in England, it was um, like higher purchase where, you know, you put the deposit down, they let you take it away, and then you pay the balance off over the next year or two or three years. I think it took my dad about three years to pay for this gram. It's one of the first stereo radio grams. It's pride and joy. And as a young boy, I was absolutely fascinated with this thing. I wouldn't leave it alone. It played 78s, played 45s. And at that time, 45s were, were new. They'd only just bought out 45s. Um, and LPs, long players. And I was fixated with this piece of kit, always playing in it, um, stacking up the 45s, um, 
and watching them down. It was like you know a home jukebox, um, and I was enamoured with that. So that kind of sowed the seeds for 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 for, for music. So obviously, we went to church. Hated going to church when they'd sing and did music and all that there. But I was really interested in any black performers because you have to understand. Um, in England in the 60s, most people didn't even have televisions. And those that did, there was only one music program called Ready, Steady, Go, which kind of morphed into the early versions of Top of the Pops. And they never, never put any homegrown black artists on. The few black acts that they put on, um, they just showed films of them or video, but they never brought them. So anytime any of these black acts like The Temptations, Marvin Gaye, um, Aretha, uh, Otis Redding, anytime any of these guys were on the TV, everybody, the whole house, we'd cut down the street, ah, oh, such and such on the TV, go and watch. And I was an avid fan of all of this, this sort of music. And by the time the, the late 60s uh, had come, I had started to buy my own records. Um, my dad really encouraged me uh, giving me the money one year, I think this is Christmas 1968, um, I would have been 10, 11, and he said, go and buy the family records for the Christmas. <laughs> and uh, so I go to my local record shop, Webster's and Shepherd's Bush, famous reggae shop, and I'm there for hours, all day, listening, feeling quite intimidated by the bigger kids there, so I was too scared to go up to the counter and ask for, for a record. Um, and in the end, just before closing, um, I went out and I said, can I have this, this, this? And I think I spent about five pounds, which would have been probably about $10. And I came back with, um, I didn't, I, people often ask me, what was the first record you ever bought? Well, I can't remember because I bought about half a dozen or maybe a dozen records. Um, Johnny Nash, Cupid was amongst those records. Um, Otis Redding was amongst those records. I think I, I bought um, the Temptations. Um, um, my girl because I was mad into the, the whole Tamla Motown thing and then brought back a few reggae records Prince Buster and all this but I did enough and the family were pleased and after that my dad trusted me and the more I went to the record shop I lived in the record shop because too young to um, the record shop was the hub and it, and it remained the hub of music for the next 40-50 years as you will be able to attest um, and it was especially for the black community in, in, in London I mean at this time um, the clubs pubs were pretty much segregated the, the, the white people that ran the clubs um, made it pr pr very clear to us they didn't want any black people in the clubs yet <laughs> um, their whole entertainment was based on, on black music you know you could hear the reggae being played inside not so much the reggae but you could definitely hear the soul and the R&B and the Motown and the stack stuff being played so we used to create our own situations at home. You know, um, the house parties in my house in the 70s were legendary. The only difference was my name wasn't David Mancuso. But I was running parties in my house from the mid-70s, you know, in, in my mum and dad's um, room, encouraged by my mum and dad, um, because I still wasn't able to go out and play. Uh, and I have to say, at this time, you know, in the mid-70s, um, I didn't harbour any latent ambition to become a DJ. There was no such thing as a DJ, much less a black DJ in the UK. Just, it was unheard of. But, you know, uh, I was young um, uh, and a serial record collector as far as, um, you know, um, resources would allow. But I was a serious party person. I read, I read every magazine. There was only one, two at the time, Blues and Soul um, magazine, which I first picked up in 1973, and they used to list all the American R&B, top 20, top 50. But going back a little bit further than that, um, my grandparents lived in, in New York in the early 60s for a little while. Um, I didn't really know them uh, because they passed away when I was quite young. But I remember that every time my grandfather came from America, came from New York, he would come with um, the R&B top 10 or the R&B top 20 from my dad. 
so you know we were always had those records you know in, in the house and that continued for a few years um and then he passed away so it stopped but you know then about 10 years later you know i started as soon as i left school at 16 got my first job all my money was spent <laughs> you know i was a serial clubber party person and and I was only interested in the music being played. Um, it wasn't, there was no such thing as following DJs, really, even though there were a few uh, DJs looking back um, who were, made a huge impression on me, I guess. Um, all of those DJs were white because we had no black DJs. We had no role models to, to look to. Um, and amongst those DJs um, would have been uh, a couple of them here in, the, in London, just recently passed away. Mark Roman, who used to play at a night called Crackers, and um, another gay DJ called Norman Scott. He just recently passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was a big fan of his um, mixed gay night on a Saturday. I'd, I'd go there, you know, this is, I'm talking 1976, 77. Um, and then there was another DJ from Greek Extraction, um, his name was George Power. Oh, yeah, me who, George. Yes, I remember uh, and George was probably the biggest influence on my peer group and my generation of black DJs because not only um, was he playing the music the way we wanted to hear it, um, because we were, all, we were buying all the records. We had all the records, but we had nowhere to go and hear them, and we had nowhere even less to go and play them. So we just had to create you know, build our own sound systems, which is what we did. Essentially, they were reggae sound systems because when my brother built um, Good Times, it was originally called Great Tribulation because of the struggles, you know, he went through to build it because my younger brother, Joey, he's, he was, became a Rastafarian in 1973. Um, and that's what all the black kids in our hood did, our generation did. So before, the clubs. let me just let me just stop you with Joey for a second. So in 1973, did you guys ever get to Jamaica yet? To no, go? because we weren't from Jamaica, but we loved Oh, you know what I'm saying? Just ask yeah, me yeah. No, we, we hadn't been to Jamaica. Um, had been anywhere. I hadn't even left the country. First time I left the country was going to New York in 79, going to America. Um, but, you know... Um, you know, I was in every club, virtually every night, I was on top of, but then I was only interested in new. I wasn't interested in anything old, only new music. And London was really good for that at that time, you know, because, you know, it's the capital city. It's where all the creatives go with. It had the, the most record shops. We were blessed, you know, our central London, Soho record shops. We had, in the beginning, two or three. Um, Contempos was one, um, run by John Abbey, who used to be the editor and the owner of Blues and Soul magazine. And there was another reggae shop called Daddy Cools. Um, they're the ones that most people remember. But we had a plethora of record shops just popping up. So we were well served, you know, because sometimes our import record shops would get up to half a dozen deliveries from the States a day, you know. So as fast as those records were coming out, you know, in New York or San Francisco or Philly, we were getting them here. And our club DJs were, well, some of them were, were, were playing them. You know, and I now realise during those seminal years, as a fanatical record collector and buyer, um, I was ahead of the game. I just wasn't a DJ. <laughs> you know, I used to buy my records religiously every week, make great sacrifices to buy my records, and then go to a club and not hear anything I'm bought. I'm hearing the same old... Yeah, but I was going to ask you, what were you hearing yeah. when you walked in the club at that time? Um, a, f a few, but maybe it's down. I now know it was down to taste um, because my taste was a bit deeper in, you know, being black, coming from, you know, and really relating to the, to the black American experience. You know, I'm having my cultural music played to me by people who've never lived it, who don't really understand it who were playing it for completely different reasons. You know, either, you know, and I know it happened in the States. I used to read about it. You know, some of these DJs were being paid to play. They were on payola. You know, you pay them, records got played. You didn't pay them, records didn't get played. And, you know, I was a purist kid. I wasn't interested in that. You know, if I'm reading about a new Earth, Wind & Fire record or a new Cool & The Gang record that I order from the record store, two weeks later it comes, 
And then I, I go out to a nightclub, I fully expect to hear that, but I wasn't. And, and that leads me onto how the Red Groove thing evolved, because I presumed that, or, you know, I presumed that everybody knew about these records. And then when I started to play out and DJ, people come up and go, what's this? Who's that? And then I quickly realized they didn't. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I've got a 10, 15 year history of this music. I've never played out. In those days, my records used to be in pristine condition because I was a collector. I wasn't a DJ. And then I used to take some of these records, play them on the sound system at the Notting Hill Carnival and realized that, you know, goodness, here's a chance. People actually like these records if they get a chance to hear them. But it wasn't about the obscure records. It was about the way records were played. Programming was the key. You know, I, I didn't have skills. We weren't mixing. We weren't cutting up records. That wasn't to arrive in the music scene for a couple of years. But it's, as you'll understand, Lenny, it was about um, programming, being at one with your audience, winning over your audience, and then your audience trusting you to take them on a musical journey. Um, and we learned all those skills from being on the sound system. I don't know how they did it in America. I think That's it's the because... That's question I wanted to ask you, which yeah. is very important. How did you know what to do to make the sound system, being that you guys are innovating and building as you're going, building all this? Yeah. What's the, what's the go-to? You know, well, the difference was it was a whole do-it-yourself culture. Um, it was, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Most of us are unemployed. We haven't got the money, except for, for those who are selling drugs or committing crime. They get the money. As soon as they got any money, that money went into buying a speaker, getting an amp. You know, we'd go down the second-hand store. We'd take old speakers. Well, not we, my, my brother and all of that generation, they did. They were self-taught sound engineers. You know, they'd walk into a store and you'd invariably be some old guy in a brown coat with glasses. You ask him a question and he'd go, oh, sharp intake. Of, oh, that can't be done. You can't do that. <laughs> He's going to go away and do the same thing. And you get an amazing sound. So for a while, there was two countercultures running, especially in London. I, I know because I was part of it, you know, the, the reggae sound system culture where we brought everything in. You know, we'd wheel our speakers in, you know, in, in a shopping trolley, you know, everybody, you know, all the community rallied around. And then there was the, the, the white PA systems who charge you money, put PA. We were never renting those things because... They didn't sound the way we wanted them to sound. And, and you can't play reggae, you know, on those the, the systems. It just doesn't work. You know, when you went into a reggae dance and you heard a coxswain or a shaka, wow. And I didn't hear that kind of clarity of sound until I get to New York. When I get to New York, I should have known what to expect. You know, we, we barely had FM stereo in England. I get to New York, my cousin meets me, he's got a, a big Iowa box, and on the box, it's got normal and then wide stereo. He went to me, Norman, listen to this. He flicked it onto wide, and it was almost like the, the records from the radio were coming out from opposite ends of the street. We didn't know that in England. So I go to a club, uh, even a crap club, you know, the sound was unbelievable, impeccable. So I went, you know, uh, when I started to, to go out to sort of black clubs in New York and then I, I went into Manhattan and went for the sound. I never went anywhere where the sound was shit. The records may have been crap, but the sound was unbelievable. And when I got back, I went I, to my brother. I went, Joe, you won't believe the experience. And, and that's what really motivated me. This was 1979. I come back from New York after spending four or five months there. A bag load of 12s. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Wait, wait, let me stop. Hold on. Let me stop. I want to get the timeline. Okay. I want to, I want to get it right. I want everybody to understand. He's now, he gets to New York. How did you come to New York? Did you take a flight? Did you take a boat? Yeah, I took a, I took a flight to New York. Well, what it was, was that um, in the mid-70s, um, my dad was really considering um, emigrating to New York um, because all my aunts and uncles, all his side of the family were living in the boroughs. Um, and I guess they were trying to persuade my dad to come there. And then my mom was absolutely adamant. You're not taking the children there. We're not going to America. We're not going to New York. 
dealing with all that racism where people have got guns, not happening. So it was decided, you know, that I would go and spend a few months there and then come back with a report. Uh, oh, you were the well, surveyor then? You were the yeah, surveyor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I, I go to meet my cousins for the first time. I hadn't met my American cousins. I hadn't met my, um, my cousins. And, and I go there after, what was the film that came out in 78, 79 with the, the subway gangs? Oh, <laughs> this, uh, I know what you're talking about. And you guys love that. It's a cult film in England. Is it a cult film in England. Oh, yeah. War- the Warriors. The Warriors. Oh, my yes. God. And I remember everybody was nervous because I was the first of my group to go there. I remember it, I, I saved up for 10 months to get the airfare because I had no job. I was in and out of work. I saved up for 10 months to go. And then when I got there, you know, the exchange rate was $2.56 to the pound. So I felt like a dollar millionaire and I got there in the height of the summer. I'd never known heat like it. And it was a cacophony of sound, just, uh, just unbelievable. I remember my uncle meeting me. And I'd only met my uncle Leo a couple of times. And instead of taking me straight to, to Flatbush, he took me on a tour around Upper Highway, East Side Highway. He took me around, around New York. I'd never seen a skyscraper in real life. It was a huge cultural shock for a black British kid who'd never been abroad before. So I go there and I remember my first words. When I got there, I just looked up the sky and I just went, New York, just like I pictured it. It was straight out of Stevie Wonder's Inner Visions. I don't know if you, um, living for the city. And that tune was in my head. If you listen to the, to, to the middle bit of <laughs> where, where the kid gets off the bus at Grand Central, yep, and a and and runner tells him to hold this for a second, and then it was so graphic. I lived that moment because Forty Second Street was was a frightening place to go. <laughs> it really was where the freaks come out at night. And that really was. To my, it really was like that. It, that appealed to my sensibility. Like I'd never seen a transvestite before. I'd never seen drug takers before. I'd never seen car charts on the street. I loved it, but was scared of it, but I loved it. You know, and my aunt and uncle's telling me, no, you don't go into Manhattan at night. I'm thinking, come on, I'm 21, 22. Yeah. Um, but then I realized everywhere I went, they asked for ID. I'm like, what do you mean? We never had that in England. To go out in England, you had to be 18. And it was never really strict. But in America, in New York, you had to be 21 and show ID. So I get there. I looked really, I wasn't even shaving. I looked really young for my age. And, but the moment I spoke, people, they couldn't make me out. What, a black person? In, in, in? Most of the people I met when I first came didn't even realize black people came from in England, amazingly. And, and I go there and I'm like, wow. And the first thing I had to do in my mind was check out the record shops. There used to be a chain of record shops called The Wiz. You know, and I w- went into the, 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 the one that was in downtown Brooklyn because my aunt worked in the store next to it. Abraham and Strauss? Oh, remember. yes. Nobody yeah. beats The Wiz. Nobody beats The no, Wiz. That's it. <laughs> no, I went in there and I remember I walked in there and they had shopping baskets, metal wire baskets, where you, could, you couldn't do that in England because all the records are behind the counter. But there you go, there you could take off albums off the shelf. And I'm like, wow. I've got the 40, because I was a 45 collector. I couldn't afford albums in 12 inches in those days. I thought, well, I've got the single of this. Let me get, get the album. It's cheap enough. And I must have put about $200 worth of albums full. And I remember the black guy looked at me and he went, you've got enough money to pay for that. And I thought he was just being cheeky. And he looked at me and I said, yeah, I've got enough money. And then he said, where are you from? You from England? I said, yeah, I'm from England. But the one thing that we learned in England, and maybe we were brainwashed that way, you know, we were always warned, you know, New Yorkers are sharp, you know. They will take the steam off your piss if, if, you're, if you're not careful. So I was very wary about being ripped off, and I mentally did all the sums in my head about how much this is costing me. I get to the counter, he adds them all up, and it comes to a lot more than I thought. And I said, hold on a minute, it should be this. He went, no, there's New York sales tax, 8%. I didn't know about the sales tax. So I had to go and put 
after I comes back. Oh, <laughs> oh, because you oh, were used yeah. to the VAT and the price. Yeah, but we never had VAT then in England. We never had all of that, you know. And it was like eight percent sales tax. So I'm thinking, well, why don't you just add that on in the price so you know what you put? But anyway, um, I subsequently went, went back. My aunt and uncle they lent me some money. I went back a few days later, weeks later, and I, I bought, bought, bought the albums. But my, my time in New York then was, was was pivotal because that summer I can remember sitting in my aunt's house watching that um, now, disco so burning, record burning session in Chicago. Yes, before we get to Chicago, so we all watched this Austin Powers whitewash, you know, yeah. what this week England was like in the 60s. Yeah, man, it was rad, man. Was England like that? No, um, very Burt Bacharachish, no. you know. <laughs> no, no, it was a very small. That was a scene they sold the world to sell London, swinging London, the Beatles, uh, you know, the mods and rockers, uh, you know. Um, uh, it may have been if you were middle class and white and went to art school, but for kids like us in the projects, no. The black kids, it definitely wasn't. You know, it was pretty much, you know, akin to. The, what the ghetto kids were suffering there. The only thing was we weren't being killed. We weren't being shot, um, you know, and we were having to deal with a more subtle type of racism. At least, you know, the, the racism that I saw, I, fortunately I didn't experience any when I went to New York, but the re- what I saw was clear cut. You knew where you stood, but there's a different kind of insidious racism that pervades here. You, you have to really be here long enough or be born here to understand it. Unfortunately, you know, I'm intelligent enough. I've been around long enough to fully understand it, how it works, why it works. Um, and I don't have the answers on how we stop it, but... That's a whole other thing, yeah, of course. That's a whole other yeah. issue. But here, then here's the question I have is now you being very intelligent, you speak very well, of course, and eloquent. When you came to America, did you notice a difference in the education level posed to the English black gentleman to the to the American guys, the American blokes. Yeah, I, I, I did. Because um, I understood, you know, in England, you know, England is founded on a class system, um, divide and rule. And elements of it exist in America simply because it was the British that brought it there. That's why you fought a war against them for your independence. Um, and if you understand the sort of deeper aspects of that history, um, it's almost like in, in America now, or has been for many years, uh, an exaggerated sense of, of that. You know, England, what, what England is the master of is being able to, you know, pull off a gigantic contract. You know, for a tiny island, they ruled three fifths of the world for, from a, a contract of making you understand that even if you were richer or, or wealthier than them, it meant nothing, which is why there was always this angst between Britain and, and America, uh, because it doesn't matter how many millionaires or billionaires you had in, in America, you had money, but you had no taste. <laughs> you were gauche. And, and the British always perpetuated that. You may be skint, but if you spoke with a Royal Oxford accent, <laughs> you were perceived of being better than that person. And what I liked about America was America stuck two fingers up at that and said, you can have your posh accent, you can have your castles, but you still wish you had the money that I had. And you don't, which is why <laughs> the British aristocracy <laughs> hated the fact that they had to invite Americans in to come and save it. And, and when you scale that up, um, it was the same thing in the Second World War and the First World War. You know, we may have given you the language, but you came and saved our artists. Britain only paid off its Second World War debt five years ago. Uh, not many people know that, but that's a fact. Oh, that, I didn't know that. I didn't know they actually. Yeah. I didn't actually know they they actually finished it. Yeah, I thought it was going to be an ongoing thing for another. Yeah, no, no. It, it was finally repaid. I think twenty, sometime between twenty ten or twenty fifteen. And you may, I may be corrected on that, but only very very recently has that World War Two debt finally been been paid. You know, but there's all of that. But I mean. That's the negative side. The plus side of it is that, you know, the Afro-American experience, it gave us the blues. It gave us the jazz. It gave us the the blueprint for modern music as, as we know it. You know, Western cultures 
you know, still want to talk about Bach and Beethoven, you know, that means nothing to me, the son of a son of a son of a son of a slave. It doesn't mean anything to me, but I do understand it and appreciate it. Uh, and in English schools, you know, the history of the African, Afro-Caribbean music was never taught. We had to go and seek it. We had to go and look for it. Long before the internet, you know, like me, a kid, you know, who wanted to know where this, this music's come from, why it's come from. You know, without the, the, the jazz and the rhythm and blues I was hearing and buying, I wouldn't have discovered other music. I mean, my gateway to jazz was through disco, believe it or not. <laughs> you know. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, the disco records, you know, I, I buy, you know, especially the orchestrated ones. You know, I was a big fan and still am a massive aficionado of the, the Philadelphia Gamble and Huff sound. I've been buying Gamble and Huff records since 1970. Um, I was heavily influenced by that, you know. Earl Young from the Tramps playing the first four to the floor syncopated beat, which drum machines then replicated and gave us house. And then when you half the, the beat, you had hip hop. Um, you know, all of those greats. And because I'd been schooled in, in that, it was an easy transition for me um, to accept any new development, you know, in, in, in black music. It's, it's never a revolution, it's a, an evolution. You know, some guy sits in a studio somewhere, pens a song, you know, somebody else comes from somewhere, um, arranges it, and all the stars align on that record or that track, which moves the game on, you know, a quantum leap. You know, when I get to New York in 79, I'm hearing the earliest um, electro records. I see DJs on Thorin's decks, big, heavy Thorin's decks, cutting up, scratching, you know, old James Brown 45s. I had all of those 45s, but I'd never, it would never occur to me to do what those kids were doing with it, you know, creating music for music. And even at that age, luckily I was old enough to understand, but this is the future. Uh, you know, I, I really got and understood that, but I still loved the music in its purest form, you know, um, I loved the disco, I loved the R&B, I loved um, the, the soul ballads. Uh, but I also, you know, I was, what helped establish me, I was also very much into black protest songs that they used to ban in the UK. You couldn't buy those records, either poetry, spoken word, anything. And that was always on my mind. As soon as I get to New York, I'm going to go to the black bookshops, go to the black bookshops and buy all of those band Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Martin Luther King, um, our speech albums that you could not get for love nor money. I have a pretty good collection of all, all of the, this, this stuff um, amongst all the other um, records and stuff I bought there. But can I just say the one weird thing I found really weird when I first went there in my latter years in the mid eighties, I'd go to, to, to record shops in, you know, in and around Brooklyn and Manhattan and when they heard me speak, those guys were only interested in, in the, the new wave records coming out of England, those kind of electronic records, which we never paid any mind to at home. Yet the record shops would be full <laughs> of all of those records, that they were English imports as opposed to, you know, we had the reverse snobbery. You know, we were only interested, if, if it wasn't on a US label, not interested. We're not waiting for the UK release. Um, to come out. But in many regards, the UK release was a higher quality pressing. You know, we, it was much, much better um, uh, pressing of, of records. Uh, hence, in England now, the, the, the UK copies of American records um, are infinitely more collectible because um, they weren't pressed in as quantities, as many quantities, but the, the the pressings were the American pressings were inferior because at that time there was the um, Arab Israeli conflict going on there was an oil shortage and instead of the records being pressed in pure plastic they were pressed on styrene from about 1973 74 I remember um, it was a very cheap product so you used to get a lot of you might remember this Danny on those early 45s albums you get stylus burn yes uh, where you get the, the record would turn white and you'd get a crackle. <laughs> when, when you bought it, it never had that. But that was because the, the, the plastic, it was called styrene. It was an inferior plastic. 
And in England, they, were, they weren't using, they were still pressing on proper plastic. So hence the difference in quality of pressing. Well, the but, combination and mixture of, the, of, of less petroleum was yeah, the yeah. problem. You had less yeah, petroleum because right. yeah. of the yeah. oil embargo going on. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I remember that too. I remember my father telling me we have to go yeah. get petrol this particular day because the yeah. letters odd and even days and so they're yeah. on long lines. Yeah. I'm yeah. to get gas. It's terrible. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah, that. But, but, but that affected, you know, record pressing uh, as well. It affected well. everything. It, it, this yeah. affected everything. Yeah. Heating, uh, home, I mean, cooking. It, <laughs> this is bad for everybody. Everything was, yeah. it was tough yeah. that time. Yeah. Um, but I was still, 1979. I was, I was still, I was still kind of going on in America, though, because we never got Soul Train. I just used to read about the Soul Train show. You know, we, we never got to see that. Um, no? No. We had it top of the pops, yeah, because there's in, in the UK, you know, there was this form. They'd never admit it, but it was. There was a form of protectionism, protect the home market. You know, we already had enough flooding of US culture. <laughs> what about our own? So, you know, um, you did. You we, did have some amazing things coming out from the UK: the Rolling Stones, yeah. the Beatles. I mean, you know, it goes on. Yeah, and but on. Let, let me tell you something though, Lenny. You know, we those bands. You know, I grew up with those bands. You know, I, I always consider myself a Beatle baby. I'm a big fan of the, the, the Beatles. Not so much the, um, them as a group, but their songs, you know, Lennon and McCartney compositions, get out of here. You know? Yeah. It, 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 even someone who can't sing, someone who can't speak, <laughs> would, would fail to ruin it. You know, their, their compositions are, are, are so great. But all of those guys started off um, discovering black records, black music, and doing their own versions. All of them, you know, all of them that came out of the UK, from the Beatles, you know, the Beatles' first hit was a cover of an Isley Brothers song, <laughs> you know. Um, the, the Stones, even though that they covered quite a lot of black records, and in the UK, they never credited those black artists. You, they never knew. On my voyage of discovery, when I'm buying the, these records, I'm thinking, hold on, this has got the same title as, as, a, as a pop record at home. Then when I play it, actually I discover this is the original version. This, and they just did their own cover versions. The whole of the British 60s pop explosion was based on black rhythm and blues records covers. Uh, that was the rule to, in those days because a lot of the artists who in America, especially black acts, weren't allowed to leave the country Many of them didn't have passports. Many of them never had agents. They couldn't tour, and that they were told that because you're black, your record wouldn't sell. So white groups would cover those records and sell millions. And in many cases, a lot of those artists and writers weren't credited. Jeez. So let me go back a little bit. You're in high school, okay? Mm. Were you, what was you in thought process as far as career wise? What were you thinking you were going to be doing? Just be like, you know, as a young man, what, what, yeah. what, what were you thinking? College? Were you thinking any of that stuff? What was no, you, you know, again, you know, um, I just went to a, a regular school. And if you went to meet the careers officer with any kind of ambition, you were quickly knocked back and told, no, this isn't for you. Be realistic. Those were their terms. You're, you're being conditioned to be factory fodder, to go and work at a car plant, go and be an electrician, be a, a, a plumber. And you wouldn't question that because all your peer group, everybody around you did that. No, but there was only one white kid in my school who went on to university, went to higher education because we weren't steered that, that way. We were discouraged, actively discouraged. You know, at that time, just like in America, you know, you're full of manufacturing you need slobs to manufacture so you're just being prepared for the, the, the manufacturing thing you know i was always reasonably intelligent but lazy you know that's what my school report did say could do better but is intelligent you know um i was pretty well read um and had a handle on what but i wanted to follow my i had no inkling that music or would, would provide me with, with a livelihood. It just, it was so far off. It was a hobby um, for me. Um, I, so I became um, a printer, an apprentice printer. Um, 
And, and funny enough, in my job, I was printing the tickets for Top of the Pops on the BBC every week. Yeah, yeah I never went to the Top of the Pops. But then I quickly realised, you know, this isn't... I, I did the job to, fin- you know, to finance my vinyl junkie habit, because I was a vinyl junkie. I did any work to get the money so I could buy records. Many is a time, you know, at the time my parents lived exactly seven miles from Oxford Street. And on my job, I'd get paid, I'd get on the tube, travel into the West End, go to Contempo. Three hours later, I've spent my entire week's wages, 11 pounds, which is about 20 bucks. <laughs> and then I'd walk home, the seven miles home, with the vinyl in my bag. That's true. That's a true collector. You really are yeah. a collector. Mm. You give everything you had just to have mm. records. That true is passion. It was a drug because I never did drugs. You know, I, I never, I'm a lifelong teetotaler. I never drank. And I guess it was one of our vices. Everyone's vices manifest itself in different ways. So, yeah, mine was vinyl collecting. Again, now we go back into New York. You, now you're here and you're seeing and smelling and eating and, and enjoying. What nightclubs did you remember going into that you said, oh, my God, this has yeah. changed everything DJ-wise? Who was around you? Yeah. Well, yeah, who was around me? Well, I can remember the first year I went in 79, or was it the second year? I can remember standing with my cousin Terry um, outside Studio 54 and thinking, at first I was drawn there because I'd never seen crowds outside a nightclub. We never had that in the UK. You know, and big, and I still love to this day, I still love American long stretch limousines. I'd never seen a stretch limousine and we're across the road in the crowd. And I can remember they had tannoys. And sometimes you could hear the, the music. And, and it was something that we wouldn't get in the UK for another year, couple of years. You know, the rope outside the, the door. A door picker. All of these things I picked up on and never seen before. We never had that at home. Um, and it was all sort of New York flash. You know, over the top. Colour. It was theatre. But to me, the music was crap, maybe because I was such a deep music head. It meant nothing to me, but I loved the theatre. And I've, in subsequent interviews, I've been asked, you know, I could easily lie and go, yeah, I went. No, I never went. Um, we had our equivalent in London at the time um, was a place in Leicester Square called the Talk of the Town. Um, and it was the nearest to Paradise Garage for glitz, pumps. It was very expensive, very elite, and only the super wealthy or uh, the glitterati in showbiz, whether you're a fashion designer, only those sort of people went and they would have somebody like Three Degrees Live or the OJs Live. Um, and it was a very sort of gauche, awful thing. Um, and those acts would never be brought to the ghetto. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, and that was the nearest equivalent. That's the nearest thing I could relate. And I used to be fascinated by the theatre of it all, not realising the significance of it, really. Um, and then in subsequent years, I used to go to um, a roller disco on Eastern, I think it was on Eastern Parkway or Utica Avenue. And there was a guy there, unknown t- to me. Um, it was a roller skating night. I think it was either a Sunday or a Thursday. And that guy was T. Scott. And, the, and that place is called the Empire Roller Rink. The Empire Roller. That's the Which place. had a rich and long system it. inside of it. Not really yeah. System. And the sound, I, before I'd heard of Richard Long, or, you know, and the sound system in there was unbelievable. You know, because I came from a sound system background. So I'm, I, I knew most of the records that were being played and the ones that I didn't know, I was desperately trying to find out, you know, where in New York can you buy these records? Who's got these records? And they turned out to be British New, new Wave records. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really cool, but, you know, but, uh, but the one thing I can honestly say, one thing I loved about my early clubbing experiences in New York was not to be prejudiced about the music you played. In the UK, we had this kind of inverted snobbery. Um, that's just the way it, it, it was, you know. Black DJs, certainly, the few black DJs around certainly didn't play anything that wasn't black. Yet white DJs could play black music with impunity and play their own music. And I remember 
coming to New York and hearing um, pop music by M. I can't remember whether I, 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 uh, whether I heard it either in the tunnel or um, um, you'll have to help me out here, uh, Lenny. If you name the clubs, I can tell you whether I went to them or not. There were so many. I went everywhere. And at the moment... At that time in 79? No, this is 81, 82, 83, early 80s. Um, Bonds uh, International. No. Uh, goodness. I've got well, them on my phone. Yeah, we, had I tunnel, made a we had Tunnel just yeah. started to, to happen. Yeah, I went to Tunnels. I went to Nails underground, Restaurant. Underground, which I worked at it. No, I didn't go to the underground. I went to the sun. But these were later, later in the late eighties. Palladium, I went to later. Uh, ah. Leviticus, Infernos. No, no. I think by the time I got there, all of those places had sort of closed or had gone out of favour. Um, area, area. Yes, area was definitely one. Um, which later became vinyl and then shelf, well, shelf and then vinyl. Right. And I went when it was shelter yep. as well. When Timmy yeah. registered. But, but yeah, when Timmy was there, but that was m- m- much later towards the end. And I, I obviously, I, I know I was the first of my group to ever go to the garage because I went there in 84 or 85. And I used to go at least half a dozen times every time I was in New York, every summer um, until it closed in September 87. And I was there, I remember, changing my flight, thinking, ah, yeah, I'll be able to go, go there. But the line went round the block. It was about 10 deep. And I remember two people were killed in the line. I tell that Such all the time. The, the, I tell that yeah. story. Somebody got yeah. shot and stabbed. Yeah. I remember yeah. that yeah. too. I say the same yeah. thing happened. I remember that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I couldn't get to go. Um, and I just gave up. When I saw how many people. All right, so, so let's say 1984, <laughs> as one of the clubs stand out, Clubs of Paradise Garage. You walk mm. in, and everybody remembers when they first walk in that club. What yeah, was that like for I, you? I remember. Oh, yeah, but, I know you do. Uh, <laughs> I, I was kind of, um, I was just absolutely in awe, almost nervous. I was thinking to myself, I remember I went with my cousin Terry. Um, because Terry, was, I don't know whether he was a member or whether he knew somebody, but I think he used to blag, this is my cousin from England. And when I spoke, you know, my, my vocal was like, an American Express card. It was accepted everywhere. I could get it everywhere just by opening my mouth, just by speaking. Oh, the way you speak so eloquently, I can see why. <laughs> yeah. And I went there and I remember walking up the ramp. And I remember the second time I went, the guy in front of me turned around and stared at me. You know who that was? Mike Tyson, the boxer. And I remember almost shitting my pants. And I remember fucking Tyson, do I ask him for his autograph? No, I don't. I was, it was always going before my head, and this time I'm trying to get into the club. Anyway, we get into the club, and I'd always, there's something that's always attracted me to New York's gay clubs, or, or mixed, mixed gay clubs, because as far as I understood, uh, the best music was always played there. And I, I get in there, and I wanted to see Larry LeVan. I thought it'd be like England. You could just go in the club, go up to the booth, and <laughs> you couldn't, and the booth was a, this you know, separate thing in the sky. All I could see was little lights up there and a a sound engineer or what was Larry moving in the box. And I'm thinking, wow, this is incredible. And I can remember walking, I think, across the dance floor and it was an idea that I borrowed when I got back. It was a huge trestle table full of all fruit and it was free, apples, oranges, and you just come up and help yourself. And that absolutely blew my mind because then I realized um, they didn't sell alcohol there. It was alcohol free. That couldn't happen in England because all of England's nightclub culture is built on pubs. It's built on selling alcohol. If you're not buying drinks, we're not playing the music. So the music was always to entice the people in to spend money on alcohol. In America, this was a cathedral to music, to dance. And this was just unbelievable and then i remember walking to another part i could not can't really remember i'm trying to recall now my first visit i remember terry said they got a cinema in here and i'm like what a cinema in the nightclub we walked into the cinema and i remember they were showing hardcore gay porn which is like all right i'm gonna continue up to the roof so we went to the roof garden overlooking it you know at the top and the music was still piped up there you know, we never had, you have to understand, Lenny, we've never had anything like this in England. 
And this was like a revelation time to me. And I'm like, wow, you've got all of this. You've got the music too. And I remember I saw in subsequent visits, I saw Lilette Holloway there. I saw Grace Jones there. Um, I saw Billy. Remember the tune, Nobody's Business? Nobody, sure, Billy. She lives yeah. in Switzerland now. She's yeah. in Switzerland living, yep. Yeah, I saw Billy there. Um, I, I saw um, Gwen Guthrie there. Because what I subsequently did, all of those divas that I saw there, four or five years later when I was running my club in London called High on Hope, um, I invited all of those people to come there and PA. Um, because it was my life dream to, to, to bring these people, because most of them had never been to England, never performed in a club. So I was responsible for bringing all of those divas there, Rochelle Fleming. Um, I, I dug them all out, all my favourite girls, because I was running a mixed gay night in London at the time called High on Hope. This precedes Paul Trouble's night by three years. For the gotcha, record. right. This is, yeah, <laughs> was, uh, it's like um, three years before, right? Yeah. Um, and it was the first kind of Paradise Garage styled, but I, I didn't want to start a, a clone of, of it. See, it's funny you say that because when I met Trouble, yeah, okay, mm. and I listened to him play music, yeah, I swore he came to New York and did with yeah. his Danza bar and hung out. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I asked him, yeah, Paul, did you ever come? He says, No, man, I've never been yeah. to America. And yeah, I yeah. swore it. And I'm thinking, yeah. man, this guy plays like he's a New York guy. Yeah, he had an absolute gift and knack, Lenny. Nobody still played that music like trouble nobody you know um and i say that as, as someone you know who's who's troubles peer and contemporary you know i remember when he first started djing you know and i used to to make sure paul had certain old records that nobody could get you know um that was my way of helping certain black djs certain black djs around they know they'll tell you you know, I'm, I was the go-to man for those rare things that, <laughs> that nobody had or nobody could get. And I would lend or give records to Paul Anderson, Jazzy B, um, Bobby and Steve, just to make sure, because the scene was so dominated by these DJs who were not giving these guys a squeeze, and it was helping our scene. Um, so I started a club night in 88, 89, called High on Hope with uh, my partner, the then partner, Patrick Lilly, he was a, you know, a, a kind of empresario, gay empresario, man about town. Um, Patrick did it, he, had, he, he was, his thing was PR. Oh yes, he's very good at that, because I worked with him at Queer Nation. I remember when uh, he had- Thank you, yeah. yes, well, I you know Patrick well, yeah. Oh yeah, I remember and, him very and, well. And, and very just well. for the record so that you know, um, before Patrick booked you to come to Queer Nation, he asked me, and I Are gave you, you the nod. Yeah, I gave you the nod. <laughs> I was always wondering who gave that. that who gave the go yeah. ahead? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh wow! Because Patrick asked me because Patrick because he you know he didn't know anything about DJs. He, that, that wasn't his thing. And Patrick knew how to run clubs and get good people in there. But in the beginning, you know, the, the music was down to me, Julia, Luke. Um, you know, or all of the people who you subsequently met because Patrick wasn't that keen on having guest DJs there because the crowd was so partisan. And I experienced the same trouble when I was with my night high on hope because the crowd was so used to us, me and Frankie Fonset playing there. I put on guest DJs like Mike Pickering. Um, Mike played a brilliant set. He was the very first DJ that we had there, but maybe his taste was too northern and then predominantly black crowds really didn't get with him uh and then the next guy we had there was a young man called louis vega no yeah. one had ever heard louis, louis, Paul. louis he had one record out which i loved and he happened to be in town and in those days we could do that he was in town he came to my night and somebody came up to me and said there's a guy in there from new york who claims he knows you and i looked in the crowd Fucking Louis Vega, and I signaled him to come up on the stage. So he came up on the stage. I stopped the music and I pointed him out and I said, "This guy has made an incredible record. You haven't, you won't have heard of him yet. Louis will tell you this story. You mark my words. This guy is going to be unbelievable." And kind of, I was gushing, you know, at Louis and Louis, a bit embarrassed. 
And I said, so I turned around to him, I said, do you want to play? He said, I haven't got any records. I said, well, you know, you and I, back in the day, we do that. I mean, it's, it's Jump on. Old, old school Jump DJ on. etiquette. I said, come and play. And he played for about half an hour, 45 minutes, kicked the roof off the place. And that was the kind of start of guest DJs because we bought the first, officially the first, when I say we, Danny Ramplin and myself, bought the first American, paid him a fee, put him in a hotel and brought him to England. And that DJ before anybody else was Tony Humphreys. We bought Tony Humphreys in 1987, partly because, I'll tell you a quick story how that happened. Because every year from about 1986 or 87, I used to make sure I was in New York um, for um, Tony Humphreys night um, where they had the talent contest, the Jersey Jams contest. And I used to go for the, yeah, to the Zanzibar um, with my cousin Terry in the depths of winter. We'd get a cab (laughs) out of Manhattan. And and truck your way. And truck your way. Yeah, you know, in that part of um, East Orange, which is really, reminded me of Brixton, how ghetto and dangerous Brixton was. Hang on, hang on. Brixton (laughs) was a fantasy. (laughs) I remember the kid telling me, yeah. Park your car behind because if you don't park it here, you ain't yeah. gonna have a car. To come out to. <laughs> that, Brixton, they didn't have that problem here. They did. It did. So, Let me tell you, it did. Yeah. <laughs> in, in those days, yeah. If your face wasn't known in the hood, mate, your car, your bike, and your wallet and your watch would go within minutes of each other. But anyway, we get to, to Zanzibar. It's it's packed and it's the the finals, and. I walked in there not expecting to see any white faces at all. I pushed through the crowd. I made my way to the booth. I see two white faces standing at the side of the booth. I'm thinking they must be local. When I get up, the guy turns around. He went, Norman, what the fuck are you doing here? It was Danny um, from Shum. Are you um, serious? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, yeah. Danny Ramplin and his then wife um, who was with him. And we shook hands and embraced. We couldn't believe we meet each other in, a, in, in the Zanzibar when no one else had been there. And that night, Blaze was performing. Ediva was performing. And we made up, in that moment, we said to Tony, we're going to bring you to England. So me and Danny shared the cost. Danny had him at Shum. I had him at, at my high and hope night on the Thursday. It sold out. Queues around the block. The pl- that club only held like 600. We had about 1,000 people trying to get in, break the walls down. And then Tony played at Shum. And off the back of our, his appearance at my club in Shum, he got booked by every promoter in England. Um, not for the music. I have to say it wasn't for the music. Tony was box office. This is what promoters understand. Put Tony Humphreys on, you'll have cues around the block. Because <laughs> most of those guys... You know, and I still, I know that, and I still say that freely now. Tony's music was too black, too soulful for a lot of those um, kids. And if you ask him that off record, he'd probably tell you that. But for my night, which was largely black, largely gay, mixed, it was perfect. Right. It was a fit. It was a fit made, right? Yeah. 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 Nailed it. And then off the back of that visit, um, the, the following year, I brought over a diva when no one knew her. Brought over Michael Watford. Nobody knew that. I brought Rochelle Fleming, Sharon Red, um, oh, wow. Jocelyn, um, Loletta Holloway. Um, I brought uh, uh, a couple of, of people. And that directly led to what was going on at Queer Nation until the divas started. Because at that time, all, they were all being heavily sampled. So everyone knew their voices, but no one knew who they were. And because I knew, I knew the history of these people and had their earliest recordings long before they were doing disco, it made perfect sense to me. You know, the transition from disco to house was, was a no-brainer for me. People go, well, Norman used to play, we don't like all this house stuff. That the, you, you'll get with it, you know. For, you know, my attitude used to be, if, if you don't want to move with it, you stick with the old stuff. You know, I may lose old fans, but with this new music hall, with new fans. That was always my attitude and outlook, you know. And then within a year, all them old school, <laughs> because you can't, you've got to be true to yourself, Lenny. You know, it's not about following fashion or jumping on bandwagons. If that's where your heart and your head and your ears take you, go with it. You can't 
lie to yourself. You may think you're lying and deceiving to anybody else, but you, you've got to be true to where your heart and head is. And I loved, not all of the music, but every week, more and more records were coming out that, I love this tune. I've got to buy it. I've got to play it. And I felt the same about those house records as I felt about, you know, Sheik's disco records or, you know, or, or Ornette Coleman's jazz records or, you know, Gangstar's hip hop records. You know, I love music. I love black music. And, and that's how my career w- was, was kind of shaped. You know, I've always been a bit maverick that way. Um, I, in my wait, whole so attitude, wait, wait, so I, I, I love house music. So wait, wait. So I didn't want to be... So hang on. So explain to everyone what a successful club night is entailing as you are now creating your vision from New York, your way, an English perspective of what you saw. You're yeah. not only just a DJ now, you're not only just a selector, but now you're also be playing the promoter and the coordinator. Yeah. What's that yeah. entailing for you? Um, I, I had to do that because no one else could do it for me. You know, I had a clear vision in my head in what I wanted how I was going to do it. So the, the next thing was to enable it or surround myself with people, you know, like Patrick Lilly, you know, like Danny Ramplin, who were going to enable me, help me create, you know, what I was going to do. I had the same attitude because I was one of the founder members of KISS FM when KISS was a pirate. And I remember talking to the people at KISS FM going, you really need to get people like young talent, you know, like Paul Anderson like Bobby and Steve, you really need to be having these sort of people on the station as well to augment the great hip hop DJs that we've got, the great jazz thing. You know, the story of our music is not just one single facet. You need people, you know, who have a view, who are leaders in their field doing what they do. Because for Kiss FM for many years, as you know, nobody played the, the, the new house records or the new dance records out of New York or Chicago like Paul Anderson. No. Still, broke the in its purest form, and I think that was a a downfall for Paul. I think that's what held him back because he was too pure, if if you can call that a fault. I mean, for for me, um, I could never go as far, and I never had an inclination to go as far as Paul went with the music because I liked too many other things, and I didn't want to hear house music all night long. Um, in, in any of its forms, even though I still love it. I made my professional career where I got paid to pay house music because the hip hop scene wasn't never going to pay me to go around the world. The jazz scene wasn't going to pay me, certainly not the, the R&B scene because it's a radio based black music art form. Either you go and see the live concert, but I never really got why people would pay money to hear the same records they hear for free on national radio every day. You go to clubs to hear things that you don't hear if you're open-minded, whether that's hip-hop or house or techno. You go out at night to hear the form of dance music that you don't hear anywhere else if you're discerning. But if you're hearing it on the radio, seeing it on the TV, well, what's the point? <laughs> right, yeah, of course. Yeah. No, and, and, and see now, this is again where here we go. I never read any of this. I never mm. heard any of this. This is nice to hear that, that mm. you know, this is what happened, of course. And I know the same players yeah. and you know them as well. But until this story is told this way, when I see Patrick Lilly, it's like, hey, babe, ba ba ba, hug. And what's going on today? We're not talking about what we did 30, 40 years ago. We're talking about right now. Like, what are we doing from day to day? So to hear that on the strength that you're, you know, all this is going on. Because even Tony Humphreys, I'll never forget hearing when he came back, he says, you're not going to believe this. You, you, how England reacted. This is all being squared over him sail, telling all of us how exciting this was. He had to bring people with him the, the following time because nobody would believe it. Yeah. Nobody believed but, that. But, but let, me try, let me try and explain why, why that was the... the, the, the uh, yeah, please. Part, why that was the reason, Lenny. Partly was because um, London and then latterly the UK, um, the one defining thing which we had which you never had because you weren't allowed to we had a a thriving underground pirate radio scene since the early 80s um most countries it's a capital offense you know pre-internet capital offense to start up a radio station in america you get life for that 
And in most countries around the world, you're not allowed, no ordinary man outside the straight broadcaster is allowed to access to the airwaves. But for some unknown reason, well, it's not an unknown reason. It is a, a reason because a precedent was set. Um, you know, BBC Radio One. BBC Radio One only started, its first core of DJs were harvested from a pirate ship in the English Channel um, in the mid-60s. Uh, I'm trying to think. Radio Luxembourg was a pirate station. And it was able to, to broadcast because it was outside um, British um, national waters, and it used to broadcast. And all the first generation of BBC Radio One DJs were stolen, harvested, <laughs> taken from that ship. Tony Blackburn, um, Dave Lee Travis, you know, th th these are names from, from my childhood, all of those DJs. And all we did with KISS was repeat the same thing. And then all of the BBC came along 20 years later, repeated the same thing. Took Giles Peterson, took Danny Ramplin, took Pete Tong, took myself, took Trevor Nelson. We all, that was the career path from pirate. The next thing you go to national broadcaster. So this, it wasn't, so they couldn't really condemn us. So that's what we had. We had a thriving pirate radio culture in London from the early 80s. So we were able to prime our audiences to American music. They had access to it, you know. And, and secondly, we had a thriving fanzine culture in the UK, which you What's never had. Mean? What's that word mean, fanzine? Uh, fanzine, um, an underground magazine. Um, the, the, the emerging underground um, rock scene, goth scene, or punk new wave scene in New York and in San Francisco, they had um, fanzines. That's how these bands became cult. Like, like, like Blondie, that's where you'd read about these, and you had that club. Again, I never went to it, but I was curious. I should have. I really, it's one of my regrets. There was a rock club down near the Bowery. Yes, very famous. <laughs> very famous club. Um, uh, what was it, Lenny? It was C -E -G -B. initial. CGB. That's the one. On Fog. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I knew, I knew I about that. Shelley. I worked for him. I, 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 I knew about that, but I was so wrapped up in black music, I couldn't, I wish I'd gone there. You know, um, it was my a wife, rat hole. Yeah. It was truly really a rat hole, a small yeah, but look, but look at the people who played there, who went there. Oh, incredible, yeah. unprecedented. You know, when I come there, I was only interested in going to the Blue Note. <laughs> I went to the jazz. I went to, to the Blue Note, and, and I remember listening to, I used to be an avid listener to WBLS. Was my, I'd never heard anything like WBLS. I used to like um, John Robinson, the master mix. Oh, my God, that used to blow my mind. John Robinson. Um, and then latterly, Timmy Regisford. Oh, God. Timmy used to make me cry playing. I knew those records. I had them, but I could never play them in a mix. I wasn't mixing. Right. You know? So how important was that to you to hear that? And what were you thinking? Like, you know, hearing I loved the it, BLS master mix. I was actually in denial to myself because I thought I would never be able to do that and convince myself I couldn't do that. But I'd quickly tell you the story of how I'd become to, to DJ with, house, with, um, with two decks. It's up until then, I was a vinyl player of 45s and albums. I just played records. So you truly were coined a selector then, in a sense. Yeah, I was a selector. selector. Um, 1987, I do a massive gig at the Paradiso in Amsterdam. I took 200 people with us that Easter, everyone went. The Face magazine came out there, which was, you know, influential style, lifestyle magazine. They sent someone out to cover the, the weekend because my friends were doing, formed a band and they were playing. That band was the brand new heavies. So it was big media news. Norman J, brand new heavies. We'd go out there. I'd smoked one too many reefers and I'd go on the bus with, to four boxes of records, four cases of records, two cases of 45s, one case of albums, one case of 12s. I get on the bus, we get off the bus, I forget my 45s. I get to the gig, and I think my, my friends are mucking around, who's got my 45s? And then it dawned on me, I've lost a priceless collection of 45s. <laughs> uh, this is in 1987, you know, um, 
I get I couldn't do the gig. I I lost my mind. I think I went on a mad bender. I got lost in Amsterdam for three or four days. It was like losing my parents or losing one of my kids. I'm not kidding. I went completely AWOL, just lost my mind. When I eventually made it back to London a week later, um, I think I think I was on KISS then, or Radio London, BBC Radio London. And I remember um, I took out a, a page, a quarter page ad in the London Evening Standard. I didn't even have the money. I offered £5,000 reward to getting these records back. But what made it worse was the Face magazine covered it. And in the very next month, the next issue, um, they, there's a picture of me looking worse for wear. And they covered the fact that I'd lost my records. And I went absolutely mental. And, you know, from that day to this, Lenny, I've never touched a reefer again. I learned a life lesson, not to be so dependent. That was the life lesson I learned, not to be so dependent on these four boxes of records. You know, you love house music, you love other things, you've got to do other things. So um, my friend at the time, my good friend, he's passed now, the, the late, great Derek B, the rapper. Um, Derek brought his twin deck system to my house. And I, I remember the first two records, because I had, you remember the Acapella Anonymous series? Oh, sure. I had the yellow, yellow one, <laughs> the green one. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, for a long while, you couldn't, you couldn't get them in, in England. And I remember it was Derek that encouraged me. He said, and Paul Anderson, well, we've got all these records. Why aren't you mixing? Why don't you? And I'm like, nah, I, I ain't the mixer. Paul, you, you do the mix mixing because Paul used to do all the master mixes and Derek used to cut up and do all the scratching and my partner carnival partner Rudy everyone even my brother Norman you really should and I'm and the more people are getting on my case to learn to mix and do the stuff is the more I rejected it and then one night Derek's around my house I'm not even sure Paul might even have been there Anderson and I just got um the acapella of Charvoni is always there and I put it on and I just got, um, they just pressed Tears by Frankie Knuckles and, you know, and the, the short story about that is that we, and I say we, um, I had a quarter inch tape of Tears a year before it came out through Frankie giving it to my DJ partner at the time, um, Frankie Fonset, because France, Frankie spent six or nine months in Chicago in LA and he hung out with them and he came back with a box load of quarter inch tapes and he went to me Norman when you hear this you will go mad and I hadn't even heard the track so we rented a quarter inch that night at High and Oak we'd never we were the first people to come with a quarter inch tape deck to play the stuff and we put the, I didn't even know how to work it my brother had to work it and Frankie played the demo of Tears fuck Lenny we had to rewind that tune about a dozen times we played it that night and we, as we were the only ones that had it, people would come to the club just to hear tears. And I think off the back of that, um, Tommy at FFRR signed it and put it out. But we were playing, we broke that record. And then I had the test press and I put on the test, the instrumental and I was playing it and I thought, you know what would work over this? And I put the acapella of uh, Always There. And it was a hand in glove mix. And you know, like when the kids who can ride a bike for the first time without falling off, I, I, I really, I never practiced mi mixing. Everything was done in my head. And if it worked in my head, it could work live. It's fine. It's and I did the mix work. and I was, I was staggered. So I took that mix and I did it at High and Hope and it brought the house down. And everyone's going, fuck it, Norman Jay, I didn't know you could mix. You dark horse, she kept that a secret. And I, the only time I, I never practiced, everything I did was, was live. If I had a mixer in my head, I'd do it live in the club. Never did it at home, never practiced, nothing. And some, most of the time it worked, and other times it, it didn't. And, and then I started expanding on that because it's something I learned from Tony about, uh, you probably understand, what's the term he used? Um, there was a term that he used. I mean, now who are we talking about in this term? Tony Humphreys. 
you know, there was a term that Tony used to use, but inadvertently I was doing that, but I just didn't know what it was called. Uh, Overlaying? Uh, is it overlaying? I don't know, but um, when all you're I you're running the because he used to run those days. Yeah. He would run mixes seven, eight, nine minutes. Yeah, records were on top of each other, so that was like yeah, yeah, yeah. overlaying. So you were overlaying. Yeah, yeah. That, that's what it's called. I wouldn't do it for that long. I never had the the courage or the experience to do and it. And he long. would do it with yeah. disco records, and yeah. disco records. So would I. Yeah, yeah. and people would be like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because the reason why we're able to do that. It's because you know those records so well. You know, I didn't, when people used to go to me, what BPM? I didn't know anything about BPM. All I know is at that part of the, part of the record, I know it speeds up. I know there's a chord change. After, so I used to ride the, the, not the fader. I used to ride yeah. the, yeah, up and down. And for most parts, for at least 16, 32 bars, you can keep it perfect. Because what I quickly understood was Motown records are made like that. So I used to take all my Stevie Wonder records <laughs> and play the Stevie Wonder songs under house beats and it used to blow people's minds. And then I used to take certain hip hop records and do exactly the same thing at half speed and realize that all of those tunes, are, you know, most of them, tune, they're locked into a four to the floor arrangement. So if you understand that, you can take loads of those songs, rock songs, jazz, so it's harder with jazz records, but certain rock songs, certain pop songs, you could lift a couple of verses and play under and do a live remix. And, and it's like juggling. Once you can do it on two turntables, you could do it on three, you could do it on four. So I used to do my live mixes on three turntables, sometimes four. And it used to blow people's mind. I mean, only for certain tracks. But I learned so much from just doing that. And that opened up a million possibilities. So why would you stick to just playing house records? Sure. You know? You know. So how does it transcending now go from being the DJ with the nightclub and getting a job and going into the record business side? Now, the record business was something Woo! I never wanted to be there part of. I never wanted to be part of the record business. Um, and I went reluctantly, only because um, a few of my peers persuaded me that I should do offers like this don't come often and you are the right man at the right time, you know, you're our elder statesman, you go and do this job. Because um, I'd always resented record companies because being a DJ gave you the freedom. You're not beholden. Nobody telling you what to do. You know, um, you haven't got artists complaining about why their records aren't out. It was all of that, you know. Um, but the actual creative process, I, I loved. But, I, you know, you're sitting in one of these stu great studio. <laughs> I've got studio envy, but I don't like studios. I can't, you know, maybe so because... clarify that. So what do you yeah. mean you don't like studios? Because you like yeah, the Yeah, I don't spend time in studios. I, I don't record. That's why I never, I've hardly ever done remixes. Um, my job as an a and man after the creative process was to come in the studio, hear what they've done. Looking at um, screens meant nothing to me. Looking at, at needles jumping up and down meant nothing to me. What I used to do when I come in the studio finally, I turn my back to everything and let my ears do the listening. And I'd be able to tell the guys, no, you need to change this. I want to hear a bit more of that. Because I just found looking at the screens and looking at needles was a distraction. I, I, couldn't, you know, I couldn't sit there and pretend I understood what was going on because I didn't. All I could understand was what, what, was what was coming out of the speakers. So that's how I, 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 I did my a and because as far as I'm concerned, I've done a and since the day I was born because I've always relied on my ears to tell me what's right and what's wrong. Not my eyes, not my hands. My ears tell me. You know, I, hear, I broke so many um, records again, new old records again um, in England, and that helped enhance my reputation as, as a DJ as well. Because when I was on something, I wasn't interested in having it first. I wasn't happen, interested in having it last. It's what you do with it when you have it. That's what counts. I always and, say the same thing, exactly yeah, that. What you yeah. do, what you have. Right. Yeah. And I was, if I loved a tune or a tune was really feeling, I'd play it two, three times in the night. You know, I was never a slave to the beat. I tell young kids that, you know, even though our, our music is kind of linear, don't be a slave to the beat. 
Otherwise, the beat dictates what you play, how you play, when you play. You know, because I come from a jazz perspective in, in that. Uh, uh, you can play anything. You know, a lot of DJs say they can't play this. No, it's not a case of can't, it's won't. Because you're locked into this four to the floor mentality. Yeah, you know, many of the times I've enhanced or ruined a house set by turning left, going somewhere else, playing a curveball. At least, you know, if it's done right, it will work every time. If it's done wrong, it's because you're not paying attention to your crowd's mood. You're not in tune with your crowd. But you know what I'm saying, Lenny, from one DJ to another. Sure. When your crowd trusts you and you're riding with them, you can go any musical direction you choose. I if know that. Trust you know enough, that. Yeah. I've done it myself. I know exactly what you mean. You can take that risk or that yeah. right turn and go, yeah, yeah. watch this, everybody, boom, yeah. and yeah. change the whole energy in the room. Or ruin it. Sometimes it's good. Or wreck the whole room. I've seen it happen too. Well, what I used to do sometimes is deliberately, you know, my favorite one that I used to do, old DJ trick, was switch everything off. Uh, You'll be amazed how quickly it focuses everybody's mind in the room. If it's not working for you, A, give it to someone else. Let someone else begin. You know, but most DJ egos, they won't. If a DJ standing next to you, come and play. Because it's just not working for you. Um, so let someone else do it or pull the plug out. Now that I have your attention, we start again. <laughs> right. Let's start all over again. Yeah. Or we wheel it back and we come from the beginning. Thanks. So yeah. what company was it that sent you an elder statesman and been invited to go into the corporate oh, that, world? That was Polygram. The Polygram company. Yeah. Polygram that owned Mercury, all, all of those things in the UK. I was headhunted along with, um, my good mate and, and jazz giant, Giles Peterson. Giles and I were the two beautiful young things. Let's, let's sign these two. Let them run their own labels. You know, and then uh, basically it will make us, this corporate giant, um, rock giant, look hip. We're down with the kids. Get Norman and Giles in. So in 1988, 89, they hired me and Giles. have to say it was the first proper job I'd had in 10 years. So I was grateful for that. I was able to, put a, to get a mortgage and buy my house off the strength of it. Um, uh, because, but I was a record hustler for 10 years, you know, buying and selling records and, you know, um, living off the street is better than selling drugs. I'd never do that. But, you know, I was, you know, if there was a rare record you was after and I knew how to get it or I had You were the man. You were the go-to. The yeah, yeah. So I had all, all, all of those because the one thing I had, even if I didn't have the DJ skills, I didn't know <laughs> I'm blessed because of my age and my attitude. I had the knowledge. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had a, uh, an uncanny knowledge. I didn't think so at the time, but subsequently when I met people and had to work, people were like, you, know, you don't know anything. Not with this music. You don't, you know, the, the bluffers and the blaggers and the writers. And, the <laughs> but you know, I quickly realized that's how the world works. Mm-hmm. You, you can't unlearn what you know. You know, what you have to do is knowledge is strength, you know. And, you know, I, I've been seen as, a, and I've been called I'm quite happy with that analogy, like an old chess player. You know, you make the right moves at the right times, which means you don't have to get in the rat race or get in the treadmill of doing things. You know, for many years, I was a creator, you know, at the head of, of scenes. Um, but in the last few years, I've left it to younger people and people who've got an energy for it. Um, but, but even and an appetite for it. Even, yeah. even before we get to the point of pasture, let's yeah. get back into young, hot, yeah. and, you're, and you're in it to win yeah. it. Okay, like yeah. this, I yeah. gave you my house. Yeah. Where, do, where do you and Giles, or sit, should I say, the vision of the street yeah. now goes corporate? How do you yeah. make that transition? And yeah. how do you make that transition believable mm. to them? Yeah. Well, th- th- that was it. We had um, the credentials. We had the street cred. So we- we're in there. I mean, at this time, Giles's Sunday sessions at Dingwalls is off the scale. If you're into jazz or anything related, that's where you'd go. My hope, my night high on hope was making the national newspapers. You know, it was so hip. It was so on the, the, the button because I remember being interviewed um, 
by ID magazine in the summer of 1986. And they were asking me, what do I think was coming next? And I'm playing um, Kern Labram's records. <laughs> and I, because I loved his sound, that kind of proto house sound with gospel vocals. And I'm saying this Paradise Garage type sound. And then the Paradise Garage became like a buzzword and no one really knew about it, no one really, but it was used as a way of describing um, house music that came from New York. It was garage. And the other music, um, the soulful original stuff came from Chicago. And the, the other extreme harder end of it, the electronic end, came from Detroit. You know, the rougher, starker, um, so in order to get it across to their listeners and to, to young people, it had to be given description. And I loved two out of the three. Didn't really get with the techno thing because I just saw that as a, as a Northern European electronic thing. Um, great, innovative, but soulless. I think because I've got church in me, I've got slave in me, <laughs> I need to hear some kind of Caribbean, African soul. You know, our music is based on the heartbeat, which is what house is, is, is about, you know. And when I came to New York, I totally, when I'm listening to Tony Humphreys, I'm listening to, to Timmy Regisford, the, the, you know, there's, there's a pulse. There's a, uh. Later on, that beat becomes chemically injected, so it becomes faster. So you get the Tanaglia, Danny Tanaglia, that tribal, da 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 and, you know, you're like me, and I'm like you. I understand the difference and the nuances under this umbrella called house music. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, I, there, there's nuances, and most crowds have now, subsequent years, have learned that, but in the beginning, they didn't know. And in, in the beginning, it was a broad church, which I liked, because some of the house raves I played at, you heard techno, you heard Chicago, you heard New York dance, you know, gospel. Um, and I loved that broad church. But when it became a lot more narrowly defined, I kind of began to lose interest in it, you know, because it was driven down these, these certain paths. So when I come to work with Giles, I wasn't, putting, I wasn't able to put out any house records at all. It wasn't, wasn't about that. It was about getting young, um, young songwriters together, young musicians. So, okay, um, we're in the job couple of weeks we don't know what to do we're wet behind the ears we've never worked in a record company before we've got a budget so we thought me and Josh thought let's just put I'll tell you what let's just put our friends in the studio I'm not going to go to talent shows or listen to people's demos I don't know these people I, you know I said to Charles look we're running two of the most popular clubs in London in that audience it's bound to be you know and we I knew we got musicians we got writers we got arrangers we got dude we got talented kids who are in our audience. Why don't we just put them, give them some money, demo time, put them in the studio? So we did. And that was Giles's mate was um, Rob Galliano. So put, you know, th these are the two bands that, that we knew. They weren't really bands, but we knew them. Were the brand new heavies and push, you know, same musicians that used to play on everyone's records. We were a we used to see ourselves as a, as a little Detroit Motown clique because, you know, we lived in West London. You know, we got people like Jamiroquai, you know, he's 16 years old. We got all of these young, talented kids, you know, around us. Let's put them in the studio. So we did. Um, Incognito, Omar. Um, and then they came out with amazing records, which, you know, our rock parents didn't really understand. But to give him his due, I have to give him his due and give him massive props for this. Within weeks of us getting in there and starting talking loud, one guy from New York was heavily on my case. He didn't know Giles, but I knew him. Desperate to come and remix one of your records. Let me in. That guy was David Morales. <laughs> and I said to, to David, um, we can't, we're not making these kind of records you can remix. No, well, further than that, the bands and the artists we were working for hated house music. They didn't want no DJs, nobody going anywhere near those records. And 
because I played house as well as all the acid jazz stuff and that, I knew, and I remember going to one of the artists who will remain nameless because he was adamant he didn't want any house mixes of his records. So I'm like, he's telling me that I'm in one ear. I got David on the phone and me in my other ear going, Norman, tell Giles, we need to get in a remix on these records. So, okay. So the guy makes his record, records it. Uh, he brings it into my office, plays it. I'm like, I just hung my head and went, yeah, I've got to play at Ministry of Sound on Saturday and I've got to play at Cream the next week. Give me something I can, give me a record I can play to 3,000 kids. This isn't it. This is great for Radio 2 and, and great for Ronnie Scott. Yeah, yeah, and that's the word for this crowd that we're going to be playing. It's not happening. So um, the compromise was, let me get a vocalist to do a guide vocal over these beats. That guide vocalist I knew because I was, <laughs> I'd booked her was Jocelyn. I get Jocelyn, I book Jocelyn in the studio. Can you just do a guide vocal, write a couple of letters, write a couple of verses, put on this thing. A week or so later, I hear the session, I'm playing it in my office on the DAT. Yeah, it's okay, but it's still too jazz funky. So I said, played it in my A&R meeting to my head of A&R, whose opinion I didn't really listen to anyway, because he's a rock head. You know, I wasn't going to tell him about rock and guitars, and he certainly wasn't going to tell me about black records. So I've got this dilemma now. Um, and then I've got added pressure, me and Giles, because um, we have to get our records released in the States as well. But our sound was too British. It just, you know, I had to go over several trips I made to New York in a business capacity to go and see Ed. Uh, what's the guy? Um, I'm so old, I'm losing my mind. But the, the head of A&R was the son of a famous jazz singer, Ed something. And he was the president of Mercury at the time. And we got on really great. And then he sort of explained to me and Giles, you know, we need to get these records on Black College Radio. Otherwise, these records won't have a hope in how it's happening. But that, that's on the side. So I, David, finally, I said, David, I've got one tune here we'd love you to do. We're desperate now. Um, because we got to get this record finished and ready and on the schedule. Um, and then when we spoke to David's management, and I knew his manager, Judy Weinstein, spoke to Judy. When Judy was quoting me what it was, I was like, can't do that. That's a king's ransom. That's all our budget on one record. We, we, we simply can't do that. So I had to go back to argue the case with my heads at the record company. I need this budget to let Morales mix this record. And basically... Um, my career as an A&R man was, was hanging on this. And I guess, to a lesser extent, Giles's was as well. So I sent the record. That record was always there by Incognito. I think we waited about 10 days, two weeks, every day. I had a sleepless night thinking, boy, this record, I don't know what it's going to sound like. Because I'm playing David's mixes, loving them. Um, I get it back, and I remember call Giles into the office. We kept everybody out of the office. Didn't want anyone to hear this. We, we had to listen to it ourselves. And we played the mix of Always There. And I went, I just looked up at Giles and smiled. And I went, that's a fucking hit record. Um, we put it out. And I think it went to number five national pop charts in the UK. <laughs> it was Always There. It opened the door for us. And when people realized, bloody hell, that's what I'm talking now, Norman and Giles. And then it opened the door. And then, and then uh, my other act that I'd signed, Omar the Singer, there's nothing like this. It went top 10 pop in the UK. It was, it's Ed Bernstein. Is it not Bernstein? Um, Wines, no, that's Judy. Oh, that one, no, is that Judy? No, yeah, 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 yeah. But, no, I'm, I'm confused. but anyway, and that put a lot of pressure on us. We had three pop hits with our first, second three um, phase of releases that, that year. And then we got our, and, then, and the Young Disciples, apparently nothing. Um, it's fantastic for us. I mean, we, the press, the, the, the London trendy music press loved us. You know, they made us label of the year. We were so cool, so hip, talking loud. Um, but our bands were dissatisfied um, because they didn't want to do Top of the Pops. They didn't want to make pop records. Um, and then we 
I've got to tell this to my head of A&R. You know, the, the, the guys are not happy because they don't want to make these sort of records, you know. Um, but it, it vindicated my decision to get David Morales to do a house mix. You know? And that's and that's that. And at that time, Morales was a hot ticket. He was a hot ticket item. Yeah. I mean, he was touching everything at that time. Yeah. Mm. Well, then, that mix opened the door for him to do everybody else. Right. That it, opened it, up it, everybody's. Yeah. It, 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 it went pop here. Well, you know, just, to, I mean, a side note, I remember when he did Imagination Instinctual yeah. in 87. Yeah. And here you have a bass line that's off key to the vocal, yeah. Lee John. Lee hated it. He told me yeah, himself yeah. he hated yeah. it. And yeah. look what happened with that record. Yeah. So you just don't know. You, you don't, don't know. know. Yeah. You've got to put the artistic selfishness to one side. Because ultimately, as a learned man once told me, the record business, it should be called the business record because it is business first. Always <laughs> the record like business that. is purely that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I learned that on one of my early trips to America. <laughs> But my, so in no uncertain terms. Oh, sure. But my yeah. thing is what I miss personally is going into, say, you're an office like you would be at, for example, yeah. playing something to you and yeah. you then giving us direction, a viewpoint, not just as a DJ, but also as, yeah. as a business person saying this can work, but we need to be like this. And that's what I feel is missing in today's music. There's yeah. no one directing everyone to say, hey, don't put that out. It's unfinished. Yeah, there's, there's no A&R. That level's been moved. Everyone's their own A&R. Yeah. Everybody's <laughs> everything now. You're the banker, yeah. you're the A&R, you're the manager, yeah. you're the marketing expert. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all, Lenny, but I just used to have a slight uh, grin to myself and, you know, here's dance music being, being made by people who can't dance. How do they know what people will dance to? <laughs> well, that was the thing I used to have in my head many years ago. So how long did that last, that, that, that affair with Polygram and Talking Loud? It lasted um, five great years. But I questioned it and I thought, you know what? There's more to it than this. You know, I didn't want to end up some corporate slob. You know, wh why are you in it? You're only in it to be the end of it, to be the record company president. And that was my love affair over with the record industry. You know, I'm a DJ. I'm a street. I'm an entertainer. I'm a... You know, I'm a 21st century minstrel. I go from place to place, play my music, making the king and queen, and they court happy, and they pay me, then I move on to the next place. That was my calling. That's what I did. That's where I was free and happiest. Everything else was a stress. So, you know, with, with, with the music business, you know, walk, working, it was great. Don't get me wrong. I go on record. I have gone on record. They were five of the best working years of my life. I loved it there. And Charles and house. Paul and that weren't, weren't there. You got your house and everything else out of it. Yeah. Really, it's a yeah, I, that was my stable. first stable job in over 10 years. But, you know, I went in there reluctantly. I reluctantly have it because before I accepted, they chased me for about a year. You know, the more I said no. The more they wanted you. The more they wanted me. That's but what it I, goes. I, I wasn't playing that, that game. I just really didn't want to do it. But I took counsel from my peers. You know, I had meetings with Danny D. I had meetings with, with, um, with um, Jazzy B from Soul to Soul. I spoke to Paul, all my peer group. And almost to a man, everyone was going, Norman, we, you really need to be in there. And when I went in there, believe it or not, Lenny, I was only the second and senior black a and man in the whole of the UK record. Yeah, industry. that's right, because I don't remember yeah. anybody else as a black yeah. man. In there was group. one other dude in there who was great, and that was Lincoln Elias at Sony, because Lincoln yeah. signed Terence Trent Darby, and he signed Jamiroquai. Right. <laughs> so Lincoln was made. <laughs> yeah. But was I could have had Jamiroquai. Yeah. You know, like the guy, the a and man who turned down the Beatles? Jay came round to my house with the cassette of um, When You're Gonna Learn, because uh, he knew, you know, we, we were the first direct link from the street to a record company. Me and Giles are in there. He came out to my house that Sunday, played me off the, the thing, off cassette. And I went, couldn't believe it. This is unbelievable. I played it to death on my pirate radio station, just off the tape. And Norman, Giles, you've got to sign me. Let me come to Talking Loud. And I had to be honest to him and sit him down and go, Jay, this is a rock label. 
they don't know how to treat someone like you. They would fail you. If you re- and Jay was desperate to get his record out, so Giles told him, go and see our mate Eddie Pillar at Acid Jazz. Within a week or thing, I think Eddie put it out on a 12. To this day, it's Acid Jazz's biggest seller. It made the company. And then um, Lincoln picked it up, Jay, on a seven-album deal for Sony. And the rest I have no history. regrets and about the, that. Wait, wait. And the but rest that, of history with Lamborghinis and Ferraris and, and mansions. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I get yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's something you have to live to regret. Now, are you I don't regret it because it was, was the say, one let's to ask a question. No, let me ask he a was question. my mate. No, and no, I have no. to be honest with him. Yeah. Let me be honest. Let me ask the question one another way. Yeah. Were you sorry for pushing him away, knowing you're doing the right thing, but could you have yeah. gotten the company to do what you need no. to make this? Absolutely no way. No Convinced way. Convinced of that, we, we know that. So from there, you know, I wasn't sorry. You know, as a mate, no, you, you need to go where they're going to give them money on your, give you the money now and do something now. You know, people don't understand that when you say that. They don't want to see, I, I know exactly what you're saying because I've had those conversations where you say, this record's so fabulous, I can't sign this because yeah. I will do you a disjustice. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, need absolutely. the the, the yeah. right company, organization, that I know that will yeah. take this and launch you into the stars. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But people are so desperate sometimes yeah. and they're looking at it as like, dude, how could you leave me in the cold? You know, yeah. they're in their brain. They're like hurting. You're like, and you're saying, I want to take it. You've done them a favor. But you've, you've done, done them, you, providing they had a connection. You were yeah. able to say, go see Eddie Pillar or go yeah. to Sony. Yeah. You yeah. had those connections and you were willing to help them. Yeah. That well, he was, I don't know if I'd have done that for anybody else, but. No, but as I'm saying. I've known him as from a kid, you know. You're not going to steer him wrong. Right. You're not going to steer him wrong. 100 million albums later or something. I'm trying to get him to do this show. I want him to talk to everybody. <laughs> I want Jay to talk. I'm going to ask him and say, you know, he needs to tell that story now. See that story? Yeah. See how this story links? Because if, J- if Jay's listening, we want you on True House Stories. It's already been put out there. I'm trying to grab him. So anyway, of course, all the great accomplishments, you, you get everything that happens. And then sooner or later, you get a, a letter from the Queen's desk. Oh, yeah. The, and uh, what yeah. the hell was that like? And here's yeah. the question that I have to ask. As being a proper black gentleman, what does this all mean to you? Getting the invitation to become sir or knighthood in yeah, music. Yeah, yeah. And what yeah. title does that mean? And how does that change your life and your professional level? Well, let me correct you. I mean, um, I'm, I'm sorry. Not a I sir. Wrong. Yeah, no, no, but you, you won't know this, Lenny. I'm not a sir, even though I was, you know, as a term of endearment and affection, I was always known as Sir Norman long before, <laughs> you know, as because I was always perceived as the elder statesman, the, the, the patriarch. So, um, and it was a term of endearment. And then out of the blue in 1989, uh, I, I remember I was in, not in the Netherlands, uh, I was in Scandinavia somewhere, Norway or Sweden, just coming from a gig, three o'clock in the morning, buzzing, can't sleep, the phone rings, and it's my head producer at BBC, because then I was working for the BBC, had my own show on Radio London, BBC Radio London. I didn't even know my <laughs> head controller, I never met him before he's ringing me like he's my best mate um norman we've had this telegram in the office uh, uh, 10 downing street which is the prime minister's office has got this telegram and it's got the royal seal on it um so he couldn't open it and it's you, you can't fake the royal seal you know it's just it's a criminal offense it's not so if you get something from the royal seal you know it's from buckingham palace the queen thing he's that's why my controller Two face shit. <laughs> and it's calling me four o'clock in the morning in in the Stockholm, like he's my best mate. Norman, we've got this um telegram waiting for you in the office. Would you like to come in and pick it up? And I said I would. And then when I got back on the Monday, I just didn't go back into the studio because I only ever used to go in the studio on a Sunday night. That's when my show was on. I'd never been in 
it in, in Radio London studio in the day or in the week. So I didn't go in. So the following week, I do my show as usual on the Sunday. Um, then he calls me after the show. Norman, you really need to come and get this thing. So he came in from home on the Sunday night after the show, and went and unlocked his office and gave me this telegram thing. And I didn't read it. And as luck would have it, because I didn't really treat it seriously, when I drove, I I'd lost it. So I didn't, I didn't take it. It was in the back of my car, in the back of my record bag or somewhere. I put it in my record bag, took the notes of it. Then um, two days later, I, I get a call from the prime minister's office, rung my mum's house. And I'm like, oh, hold on. I spoke to this woman. So are you, Norman Jay? Well, we've been trying to contact you. We sent you a, a, a telegram. And I said, well, what's it for? What's it? They wouldn't tell me. Um, so that, so me and my suspicious nature, I said, well, if this thing has got the royal seal on it, can you send it to my parents' house? And then I will respond. Six, seven o'clock the next morning, the mailman brings this letter to my mom's house. Sure enough, it's got the seal. When I opened it, it said, Norman J, um, you have been um, awarded an, an MBE. Now, you have to understand how special this is. I mean, there are some detractors from it, but... Up until this time, and all I'd done, all I had achieved, I didn't feel bitter, but I was aware of the fact that uh, I was never properly acknowledged by the then music, black music or dance music thing. Never felt, you know, properly vindicated. So to get this from the queen of your country... (laughs) There's no accolade, you know, no DJ Mag Top 100. No, that doesn't come anywhere close to, to this. And as the first DJ ever to be um, awarded it for my um, achievements in black music, that's what the, my citation meant. Other DJs have had it, but it was always for their charity work, never for their profession. So to get it, for my profession, for my services to, to, to black music. Uh, and I think I've subsequently learned it was to do with the fact that I run Good Times at Notting Hill Carnival for the community thing for over 30 years. It was massive. Um, and I'm sure that had something to do with it because you, you have to be nominated for it. And it goes through seven very secret selection processes. You don't know. And when they send you this telegram, you have... 48 hours to officially acknowledge it, accept it, or to formally decline it. And I was fast running out of time. <laughs> so I rang the code number that was given to me, and, and I got through, through, I had an access code, and I said, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Norman Jay, and I formally accept this thing. So you're kind of sworn to secrecy because you get awarded it, but you're not allowed to publicize it until, and this is still true today, it appears in the Times column six months later because you're awarded it in January. If you're awarded it in January, you pick it up in, in June. It's the Queen's Birthday Honours list. If you get it in the summer, you actually go to the palace and pick it up um, six months later. So, of course, I, I, I couldn't tell anybody. I, didn't, I was sworn to secrecy. I told my mum, my dad. I told my dad, girlfriend and my kids, but I made no mention of it. And then the day of the Times publishing it, boy, I was in that, I was the first guy in the paper shop, six o'clock that morning, picked up a copy of the Times, <laughs> looked down, list of names of knighthood names, and then there's Norman J, MBE. I was like, ah, wicked, that's it. And then you're allowed to let your publicist know if you've got a publicist. Um, and, and it was a big deal, because at that time I was working for the BBC and at the investiture at the palace, when in those days the Queen herself was doing it, and nowadays she's so old she doesn't do it, or she lets Prince Andrew, one of them, do it in one of the castles around England. But I was especially pleased because the Queen did mine at Buckingham Palace. And another reason why me and Jay, um, Jimmy Require, are so close is that Jay was one of the first people to ring me and congratulate me. And he went, how are you getting there? And I went, Jay, I don't know how I'm getting there. So he lent me, you know, he's got a massive collection of classic cars. So he said, here's the the guy's number, my manager who runs my garages. You go down to my 
lock up of cars, pick whatever you want. You take whatever you want, and I'll get a chauffeur to take you and your family there to Buckingham Palace. So he suggested that I take, I can't I think it's a 1936 Mercedes. There's only about four or five of them in the world. It was amazing car, black car. <laughs> and I remember when I rocked up to the palace and that, people was just like, whoa. And I, I thanked Jay from the bottom of my heart because that was an amazing gesture. You know, he goes, if, if, I, if my man's going to Buckingham Palace, I've got to make sure my man's arriving in style if he's meeting the Queen. But anyway, we, we, we went there. And because I worked for the BBC, it's, again, good fortune. It was the first year BBC cameras were allowed into the palace to film the investiture. Up until that point, um, royal protocol dictated there was no film cameras allowed in the palace. All you had to do was do the photo call afterwards. And I remember... I think, if memory serves, I was there. Even the reason why there was heightened uh, media interest is because Mick Jagger accepted his knighthood at the same time. And off the back of that, I got to play, and Mick invited me to come and do his birthday party. So I played his, his birthday party in his wow. massive mansion. Uh, 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 and again, you know, that opened the door to me. See what I'm know. saying? See how this music takes you places you never dreamed of. <laughs> yeah. I tell that every time. You never know where you're going. Yeah. And now you were doing the Stones, the man yeah. of the Stones. Wow. Well, yeah. I, 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 did, I did did a few. Mick was so cool. I was so nervous. I didn't know whether to, to be, to you know, uh, to call him Mick or Sir <laughs> Mr. Mick. Jagger. <laughs> Sir Jagger. He just made me feel so at ease. He was great, you know. He's another one that used to go to the garage. Yeah, yeah and, and I played, and when I went there, I was playing a lot of 60s R&B because I knew, and that basically, I wasn't having a dig, but there was, it was loads of Ronnie Wood. A lot of those 60s aged rockers were there who'd made their initial names off of playing black records. And I kind of thought, I'm going to complete the circle now. So I came back there, I was playing a lot of rhythm and blues, a lot of 60s stuff, and the old crowd in there were absolutely loving it. You know, okay. Otis Redding, I'm playing Aretha Franklin, I'm playing Wilson Pickett, a lot of rarer stuff that, you know, Cilla Black covered, the Beatles covered, because I knew that I had all of the original of these records. And it was basically a, a 60s revival this night, which was, was great. Um, but that, that, that's an aside. But... I get to the palace um, and, yeah, uh, because of royal protocol uh, dictates, you're only allowed to bring three members of your family. So I couldn't bring my parents. I brought my then girlfriend, the mother of my two sons. Um, uh, it was a, an amazing day at the palace. And then I had a reception at a club afterwards that night. Um, I had a morning suit on, top hat, you know. Very British upper crust. There's pictures of it on the internet. Um, you can you can find it. Um, and all my, my friends came and gave me tremendous welcome because it meant such a big. None of us, you know, in our wildest dreams, you know, in dance music and black music, these things don't happen. That's true. It, it happens happen. to me. It, it doesn't happen. And the difference it made was, was amazing because I walked through. Um, Luckily, there was a lot of goodwill and, and love towards me anyway, which I always appreciated, really grateful for, you know, but in the darker areas of the community, just like, why? You know, even my parents' generation, a lot of the old people come up and go, well done, congratulations, you've opened the door, you're the first. And this is bigger than winning any accolade in any music magazine, you know, who chose to, to ignore what you were doing anyway, whether it was by accident or design. That's the way it was. We were never acknowledged. And then to be acknowledged by, you know, the highest hierarchy in the country, the most important. You can't buy that. You can't vote for it. You can't buy it. You know, and because MBE stands for Member of the British Empire. Now, there's many especially with this Black Lives Matter thing, there's a lot of detractors to that, um, about that. And I've always stayed clear of any controversy. You either make a decision to accept, and a lot of people accepted, and an awful lot of people, especially a lot of black people, declined it. But that's their business based on what they felt was right or appropriate for them. 
I accepted mine and had no qualms about accepting it because for me, it showed um, a positive example, positive role model. You know, I never preached or talked about it. Um, but please but do. But please but do. Subliminally, no, but subliminally what I was doing was saying, you know, just because you're born in the gutter doesn't mean that you, 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 you stay in the, in the gutter. You can rise to, you know, have a self-belief, a determination, a little bit of luck, and do the right thing, you know, be honest to yourself, be yourself. And when it came to music, I was always about that. Um, and and it, it worked for me. And it just showed, you know, after that, I used to go around with quite a lot of um, disadvantaged kids, a lot of disadvantaged um, um, schools, and give these lifestyle talks to these kids and go, you know what? You know, forget all your gang rubbish. You know, you're not telling me. I mean, you know, I used to say to them, what you're just learning, I've long since forgotten. I'm a grandfather. I've got a 10-year-old grandson, you know, who's a virtuoso pianist, by the way, classical pianist and trumpeter and drummer, you know. Um, but that's another aside. But um, to be a positive role model, I never preached about it, never did anything. All you can do is lead by example. And it did have a positive influence. I mean... Uh, it entitled me to certain privileges, which I chose not to accept. Because I'm an MBE, I could actually, I have the right to get married in St. Paul's Cathedral if I chose to, <laughs> um, but chose not to. Um, and in the beginning, I never used to use my title after my name. And then when I spoke to some people, I thought, why not? Why be typically British and shy and coy about it? You know, when these people have their sirs, you call them by sir. So this, name that. So I'm going to put MBE after my name. And I've never looked back. And when I'm formally addressed, I get addressed as Norman J. MBE. <laughs> yeah, Sir Norman. Congratulations. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it's an inspiration for all of us that you yeah. did something of that great. It's amazing. Mm. It's amazing. Well, from my <laughs> humble roots and beginnings, it just, it's, a, it's another league and another level. Um, and without starting off the way I did and enjoying the music and I did the way I did and playing to crowds, and you never know who's in your crowd, Lenny. I've always said that. Oof, I said the same you know, thing. The next president could be in your next party. You don't know that. <laughs> I remember when I played in San Francisco, Eddie Murphy was in the crowd. He came up to the booth. Yeah. He came to say hi to me. I was like, oh, wow, it's Eddie. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, whoa, Eddie Murphy's here. Like, he's yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, next thing you know, I'm giving him a drink. It's like, this. Like, yeah, you yeah. don't know. You don't yeah. know. Yeah, absolutely. So here's something that I got to ask you because I noticed it's a bit of the, your cheek kind of cringed a bit. Mm -hmm. The affair of your time at BBC to the ending and where you are now as a radio selector, presenter. Can you tell everybody about that? You know, yeah, and the BBC was great. It get you know at the end of the day, it's a national. And this is pre-internet and pre-online. Um, it gave you a national exposure, you know. And I used to have, I had the luxury in in those days. I can't remember when I was on there. It was during the nineties, early nineties. You know, I spent thirteen fantastic years every Sunday night, um, doing various incarnations of my show, the original Rare Groove show. Um, uh, I can't remember, um, Giant 45. I had various incarnations, but it just meant that the BBC gave me a platform to indulge for three hours. No other presenter on national radio was getting three hours, you know, to play, you know, black and dance music. And it was a real luxury. And even when the BBC started to go digital and online, that I was one, well, I was the first show at Radio London to be trialled as, as the guinea pig. And... Um, I didn't like it at all because my whole attitude to radio was, um, I was kind of ambivalent towards radio because I don't know if you know, I was a founder member of KISS FM. When yes, Kiss I do remember it, clearly. Yeah. Yes. And I want to say one thing to you. I want to ask this question now that you make me think. When I first yeah. saw the KISS lips, yeah. was that KISS 98.7 WRKS uh, FM in their, your minds? Yeah, of course it was. I had yeah, a feeling that I, I said, yeah, I stole it. New York. This yeah. is New radio. I thought I said to Gordon, let them come and let them come over from into England and sue us. We, you know, we're only a pirate station on for twelve out twenty four hours under the weekend. 
yeah, they haven't got a copyright over that. They'll tell you they have, because Americans always tell you that, but they haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Americans are always blagging. And then, show us the paper. Show us the license. You can't blag a blagger. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but so yeah, that, it's, so it's, that pirating yeah. thing took you there and BBC, and yeah, now, yeah. where are you today now? Because now, um, what are you doing for, for so radio now? When the lockdown began, um, I had a loose association with a station uh, here in London, an internet station called Soho Radio. Um, very sort of hip and trendy, not just about music, it's the arts and cultural life. You know, it, loads of varied um, uh, presenters, which is fantastic, which is what London's always been about. So I thought I didn't really want to join, you know, I won't name names, but I didn't want to join another dance music station. I didn't want to do any of that. I wanted, the only way I was going to get back on radio was to be the person that brings the music element to a station that does arts, poetry, um, social commentary, um, style, lifestyle. I wanted to be the person that comes in bringing that. That's what I'll bring to the party. So I used to do the occasional show for um, Soho Radio because my management um, uh have an involvement in it and occasionally I used to and I still do the odd standing shows for BBC Six Music which is great but I didn't want to go back onto radio full-time because I'm a I fell out of love with radio I'm a full-time DJ I don't really want to to do to, to do the radio and I felt radio for me was overexposing me um, so I thought in this day and age with, with the internet and uh, people doing everything for free. Um, for me, less is more. The the less they see of me or hear of me, for those who want me will strive even harder. Well, we want you, damn it. It worked for me because um, my gigs were always full. <laughs> my gigs would sell out because I never put mixes up on the internet. I never gave people access on, on the internet. So if you're an internet fiend, people think, oh, well, Norman Jay's not really happening. Come to my gigs, they're full. <laughs> As opposed to people who are omnipresent on the net, yet they can't get arrested in a the club. They can't, they can't fool people. You know, they can't get people to come. So I just, in no, my instance, so um, less was more. Well, let's be honest, you're an icon, for God's sake. You know, these well, some of these other guys. Yeah, are not but I don't consider myself. You call me an icon, and I'm really chuffed and flattered to hear that, Lenny. But I don't consider myself well, that. Well, let me, um, well, let me wait, wait, wait. Hang on. When someone I know personally, who I can call a friend, has an MBE, that's yeah. iconic. <laughs> I don't have more to say. What do you say? Right. How do I top that? I had a hit yeah. record. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I get it. But it means beautiful. I've never had a hit record like that. I've never made a record which has done well, but I've had fingers in pies of very successful projects, um, which is which is great and quietly satisfying. You know, yes. To be in the background, you only know it's me if you see me or if you ask me, but otherwise you won't know. I've, you know, uh, I'm the ghostly hand. <laughs> In, does in anybody else know? Does anybody else does also know if you, those who are tuned in and watch this amazing interview know that this man is also an uncle of somebody else in our music industry? A yeah, guy that's making his name now, yeah. and I'm very his, proud of him. His uncle, yep, Melvo. Tell us, tell us who it is. Who is it? Melvo Baptist, right? Yeah, I mean, and he's the next generation, one of the leaders of the new school. Um, you know, he is au fait with the whole internet thing. You know, we, we I guess you and I, Lenny, we are the, the generation that uh, um, embraced all the new technology in the 80s and 90s. You yeah, know, we talk, yeah, we. that's yeah. pretty much it. We're, we're, we're the MTV generation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're inside of it. We actually were yeah, harnessing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but... Yeah, he, he he's great. I mean, what else can I say? I, he's I good love looking. Him. He's good looking. He's fresh. He's got a great yeah. attitude. Yeah, fit, you know, and got a knack for picking great records. Yeah, he's good at that too. His new like records yeah. good too. I like yeah. that he get cat bad company. Very good. Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, it's, it's great. So, uh, and then got the next generation. He's not ready yet. Um, 
but he soon will be. But whether he comes into this area of music um, remains to be seen. I, I don't think so. Uh, but yeah, my, my grandson, he, he's, he's amazing. You know, Ten years old, already playing yeah, three ten. instruments? Yeah, he can play the piano at three. Yeah. I, I, we call him a prodigy? Yeah. <laughs> I think it yeah. sounds like, a, to me, it sounds like a prodigy we got there in the house. <laughs> yeah, but his is toward, more towards the... the Funny, the what, your father, what your father tried to put in front of you... Yeah. Again, here we go, full circle. Yeah. Now you're watching your grandson tinkling on the ivory. Isn't yeah. it incredible? Yeah, well, he, he reads music. Uh, yeah, he's simply amazing. And his dad, you know, um, used to play music, but chose not to have a career in the music industry. You know, one question I have, I ask everybody, because your, your, your story, I mean, you covered so much. Is there anything you regret in our career? No, I, can, so I don't really have that regrets. You know, um, even the regrets are a good thing because... You learn from it. If you're smart, you'll learn from. You need to make a mistake. You know, nobody's perfect. You need to make mistakes along the way. How else? How else do you learn? Um, when I, I look back, you know, I've been very lucky. Like I said, I'm part of Generation X, who lived everything, lived life, saw everything, done everything, was part of everything, and all the excesses as well. You know, this post-COVID generation will never know that. Will never do that. Um, so. You know, I'm I'm lucky and I'm blessed and I'm still interested. I still have an, an an interest. I still love the process of discovery, whether it's discovering new music or new artists or new old records. Or, but I guess my headspace right now is about um, rediscovering um, n- new old stuff or rediscovering old stuff because up until now, up until this whole COVID thing. Um, and I might sound a hypocrite by saying this, but it's what I firmly believe. Um, old records never really meant anything. They don't really m- mean a lot. And depending on which side of the coin you're, you're on. If you're an artist and you're making new music, the, the creative process has to go on. Otherwise, how else do we have old music? Because someone needs to make it. But right here, right now, with COVID in all over, over the world, it's... It's the reset button on how we live, how we appreciate things, how we consume things, how we look at the world, how we look at each other. And right now in this time and space that we're in, what's keeping us sane, what's keeping us sane, is either the recent or the old happy memories. Suddenly, we're, because we're denied the things that we took for granted, and let's face it, we take it for granted, Suddenly we're remembering the happy times in the clubs, the great records we heard, the way we celebrated, hug, kiss, chase girls, chase boys, the things that we took for granted, took loads of drugs, took loads of things, going mad when that big record that you love came on. And right here, right now, our focus isn't on any of that. Right, that's right. You know, and, and so I really feel sorry for the, the people who are, in the middle of the creative process now. I hope they don't stop because when this is over, we're going to need to hear their songs, their records. Yeah. <laughs> and the DJs and the, and the their mixes. We're going to want that. Do but right, really right now, we've played yeah. pause and all we want to do is to be, this is why I think one of the reasons why one of my radio shows are, are so successful because, you know, we are nostalgic. You can always resell, repackage nostalgia. Uh, I'd say the Americans are great at that, and the Brits. Oh yeah, um, the Brits are excellent. At it. You know, resell, repackage, rewrite, and they resell the history. Um, so uh, you know, I'm reminding people with the songs I'm playing of the of great times. Everyone could go, ah, oh, I remember that. It's almost like the, the greatest hits of your lifestyle soundtrack, <laughs> um, interspersed with you know one or two music that puts it in perspective and makes it relevant. Um, because there's only a finite amount of good old records you can play. But right now, um, people, because they, they can't go out, the one medium they have is this. So they're listening. You know, it's, COVID has been a godsend to Spotify, <laughs> let me tell you. I know. I've seen <laughs> and all, it. all of those music streaming services, because 
you know, people can't go out to go and enjoy that music in the flesh. So the next best thing is to stream, listen, download. Do you believe, do you believe we're going to have, when this is over, the COVID era, do you believe yeah. we're going to have, after th- we're watching everything being decimated due to the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Do you believe that out of the ashes, Phoenix will rise again? Yeah, of course. Ab- absolutely. Yeah, you know, you, you have to. Otherwise, you might as well just switch the off button off now. <laughs> you know, somebody somewhere will be creating good things for us to do, for us to disseminate, for us to listen to, for us to enjoy, for us to consume. The world won't stop. We've just got to find new ways of dealing with the present impediment or the predicament we find ourselves in. But the creative process will continue. It always finds a way to manifest itself. I mean, look at this. You know, um, it's a blessing. I mean, oh, you, we we connect this way again. Yeah, who never thought we would be doing this? It's incredible. Yeah. And the people watching are saying, please don't stop. Please don't yeah. stop the interview. We can listen to you all night. Please don't <laughs> stop. I can't keep reading it. I says, and it gets to a point we're going to have to stop. But No, we don't have to stop. We don't have to stop. You, you choosing to press the, the off button. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. But then that leaves us open for a part two. In six oh, months. for sure. My God. We're at a, a post-COVID, what you should do. Oh, yeah, we'll do a post-COVID. Everybody again, post-COVID. It will come. What's your prediction for America with the, uh, with the, with the elections? What do you think is going to happen? What do I predict? Well... What do you believe in your heart, gut-wise? Gut-wise, it's in your hands. Not in my hands. You, you have the power. When I say you, you, your hands, outside of his coterie of know-nothings, <laughs> if all the people, Native American Indians, first American Indians, Hispanics, Blacks, Jews, all the people who Trump calls foreign alien, immigrants, not Americans. If you all got together, he's out the door. Because, you know, you have a know-nothing president who's not very well educated, who's not anything. The one thing he does know how to do is corruptly make money. He's the only man I've ever met who tells you night is day, day is night. When, (laughs) you know... America, it's a huge country. It's a world leader. There are many great things going on there, but so many bad, dread things are happening there and here. And it's in your own hands to change it. The destiny of your country, like the destiny of our country, is in our own hands. Because while there's a so-called democratic process, use the ballot. You know, he will do everything to persuade you from voting closing down polling stations, saying the vote's rigged. Don't buy that. Go out and vote in your millions. And you can correct this wrong. Said it right. Said correctly. God bless you. God mm. bless Norman J. MBE. Well, on a micro level, we got the same thing here with our stupid Boris here, our prime minister. You mean the that. twin brother of, of Trump? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You're dealing with it too. Are you guys going to vote? Are you going to revote this too when his time is up? Are you going to? Of course. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because our system is based off of your system. Well, no, both of our systems are based off of um, Greek. Yes, um, you know what I mean. Yeah, 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 but yeah, it's the Greek democratic process. The thing is, we don't have democracy. No, you know, democracy is an illusion. The who holds the money holds the power. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, he holds the pen, rewrites the history. That's right. We said that from day one. So yeah. my history is being rewritten as we speak right now. <laughs> well, everyone, yeah. uh, they, they, people have asked. I mean, you have answered. I didn't even have to ask questions. They didn't know to ask because the, the answers were there. That yeah. you, you, you alluded to as you un- unveiled your story. And the story is compelling and incredible. It's unfinished and it's ongoing. And it's, it's still being written. Yeah. <laughs> There'll be more. Part two will be truly later on. Mm. And I have to thank you graciously that you... No, I've got to thank of- you, Lenny, you know, for, you know, you're a leader in your field doing this. It needs to be done and nobody thought to do it, but you, 
you did. And I, and I give you enough props and credit for that. It's fantastic. I, uh, I did it with BBC Radio 6 when they allowed me to do the Legends of Dance for when I had Eddie Gordon took my tapes and we did yeah. the Larry LeVan story. So yeah, this yeah. is just another extension. And yeah. I started it pre-COVID while back and then I left yeah. it. But then mm. COVID said, you need to do it because people yeah. need entertainment. Yeah. And Facebook is stopping all the music, so you can't stop us talking. <laughs> so there we are. <laughs> yeah. But they can stop well, us dancing. Right. They we can tell us. <laughs> we, can, we can explain the situation of the music. We can explain yeah. the records, but we can't play them right now, but we will yeah. be happy. And mm-hmm. someone like yourself, who is a true selector. Oh, one last thing I wanted you to tell everybody, because we were talking pre to us starting was, mm. The DC, you, you know, I did DC LaRue's story, the cathedrals, yeah. mm-hmm. and how you went and bought in those days seven inches. Yeah. Why yeah. didn't you buy the twelve inch version at that time? What was the well, the, the twelve inches were the uh, that record was symbolic to me. I I can't t- tell you how much emotion I've invested in that record. I absolutely love it because when it came, it came. In the UK, it was amongst the first batch of 12-inch disco discs, as they called them in the UK then. D-I-S-K-S, they were, they were spelled. Um, and really, the economic situation in England meant a lot of us working-class kids, kids from the ghetto, we couldn't really afford them. You could, we could barely afford a, a US import 45, um, which was 75p, and I can't work out how much that was in in dollars at the time but if it's 75p if you two and a half times it was roughly the equivalent so if you two and a half times 75 then you get two dollars yeah yeah two dollars or two dollars 25 two dollars a lot of money in 1976 a lot of money (laughs) um so there was an, an initial backlash they didn't sell because of the price point not because the records weren't great not many people could afford them because the the buying culture was primarily 45s um, for teenage kids like me. And if you had a job you were working, there was the album culture. You know, so you didn't buy 12-inch. Why would you want to buy a 12-inch version of one record for a few bucks less than the cost of an album? Why would you do that? But the people who criticized them was the record industry and who weren't going to nightclubs. You bought the 75 edited version. You played it at home. You played it everywhere. You loved it. You put it on a cassette. You loved it. When you went to a club, well, very few clubs in those days, you heard the 12-inch mix. The sound quality was still crap, not because the record was recorded or pressed crap, because the sound systems in the UK were crap, um, period. So when you buy these records and you got them home, as I did with DC LaRue, I, I know because it, that was like half a week's wages, a week's salary to go and buy that record. When I got it home, I was like, wow. I still own that record, bought in the summer of 76. It was, and I could still remember it like it was yesterday, the biggest records in the clubs, in the London clubs, mostly the black clubs, but a few mixed clubs was um, DC LaRue, um, Cathedrals, Double Exposure, 10%. Um, uh, I remember because I had bought them all that summer. Um, Young Hearts Run Free, Candy Staten. Um, Walk Away From Love, David Ruffin. Uh, uh, one of the other big records was D- Doc Severinsen, I Want to Be With You. Uh, and th- there were a-, a few others, but they were the, the main labels. Was, it was, that was a, the, the label that launched South Soul as a 12-inch, even though I was buying South Soul records um, before that you know, on 45 with Joe Batan, The Bottle, the first release to come out on South Soul. Um, and yeah, there was about half a dozen of those. Let's get it together. El Coco, I remember, was one of them. Heart and Soul, Do the Walk. You know, I can reel them off like they were yesterday. Um, the Heart and Soul record, was that Brunswick? Uh, no, Heart and Soul, Do the Walk. It might have been Brunswick. It was a I think it was Brunswick, I remember. It's yeah, but sometimes, but sometimes in the UK, they brought them out on the... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's PIP, P-I-P. Right, with the black label, they had the PIP on yeah. the side, right, black label. Yeah, 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 I remember now. I yeah. have that record, I forgot yeah, that. Yeah. Purple cover. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 There were a few of those. Yeah. And then later on, um, the following year, Diana Ross came out with um, Love Hangover. 
Um, and even then, I think that was the first commercially um, available 12 in the UK. There's some argument over that. I don't know. I'd have to search through my records because I got all my records in year order. So as far I as I remember, that pressing that came from the UK was much better than the 12-inch promo. In America. Yeah, yeah. Much better. It was cleaner. The EQ curve. The yeah, A- yeah, yeah. Louder. That yeah. was the thing we all said about the Americans love about the UK pressing before you yeah. said it. I wanted to say this to you. It was louder. Yeah, that's right. It was cut loud. They yeah. weren't, they, because they I were think always, they were cut at 33 and your 12 inches were cut at 45 in America. Because I know some of my early 12s, they cut at 33. Right. So uh, I can't remember the, the sonics or dynamics behind that. But well, I know the European curve that they use in the mastering process is, yeah. is, is, is a much sharper curve than the American yeah. curve. Well, you're probably more well in that, that, that area, being a producer. No, you can hear it. No, you can hear yeah. it. No, you can hear the record. So you be, because you guys, all of you guys would always go to the American Presses. You like that darker sound. And I always love that bright British sound. That well, it, it wasn't always about the sound, Lenny. It was about the, the, the label kind of snobbery. Yeah. <laughs> the track had to be good. Let's start with yeah, that. You had but a lot of kudos by buying having a US copy, you know? <laughs> By the time you bought the UK copy, which came out, you know, weeks later, or sometimes months later, or sometimes not at all, it was, it, it was whack. But then when you got the UK pressing, it was actually a better quality. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. And it was clean virgin vinyl, yeah. well cared, and you had the artwork was, yes, and that's mm. something else. Mm. You know how many records we're discovering now? Mm. The American records, for example, Tavares, those groups. We never saw yeah. these videos, but all of a sudden, I've yeah. been seeing from the UK these videos come out. I'm like, where yeah. was this back then? We yeah, because they were filmed on top of the pops. They were on the t- right, the- and we were like, I never saw them perform yeah. these records. Yeah, yeah, because they crossed pop. They were all pop records. Yeah, Tavares. Yeah, Vicky Sue Robinson turned the beat around. You know, oh man, there's so many great records from that era. So many great records. Yeah. Dr. Savannah's band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Corey Day. I mean, uh, it goes on. But you know, Day. you shocked me with this one. I mean, some people were shocked too when you said this. Um, your love found for jazz through disco. Yeah. What was the it disco? Was, I want to ask you this too. What was the disco record that gave I'm that? Trying to, I'm trying to think. It was uh, a fifth of Beethoven. But but in jazz, okay. That's classical, though. Yeah, but there's jazz versions of that as well. Um, I'm trying to think of other tunes at the, at the time, because a lot of jazz artists around 76, 77... Well, um, Harvey Mason... Yeah, wanted Mason to get paid. So right. some, went, some went... Roy with Ayers. Them, others didn't. Roy Ayers. Yeah, Roy Ayers was another gateway. Um, George Duke. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of them. Yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> there's tons, tons of jazz guys. Russian. Yeah, yeah. Russian, loads of Russian when, pro- prolific keyboard player, yeah. prolific jazz pianist. Yeah. So yeah, that's where I made the con- Herbie connection. Man. Yeah, and then when I, you know, Herbie was a reluctant disco thing. If you read about Herbie Man, he hated disco. But most of them did. Hey, Norman, most of those guys were yeah. real jazz aficionados. Yeah, they yeah. hated disco, but they yeah. like said. Budgets yeah. were throwing their face. Yo, here's some money. Go run with I it. I loved it because I wasn't a musician. I was a kid on the dance floor. You know, uh, this is why I'm glad I never, I never was brought up the, the musician studio thing. I'm glad that my music discovery, my gateway, my pathway to it was on the dance floor. You know, for all of right. us, all of my generation of peer group DJs, you know, Paul Trouble, Jazzy B, Trevor Nelson, we found that music on the dance floor, you know. And then went away, bought it. And then when I come to America and I'm looking through second, I'm like, oh, God. So they've made other stuff. You know how much time I used to spend crate digging in New York in the, in the 80s? Man, I educated myself. I tell people this all the time. I used to go into Brooklyn neighborhoods that were really bad, right? Yeah, yeah. So there'd be like a bodega front and in the back have racks of records. And what would I yeah, see it, in there? Promos <laughs> of like Atlantic promos, South yeah, promos, yeah, yeah, 70 yeah. cents. Yeah. Six, I nobody wanted this music. Up. Nobody wanted it. Nobody yeah. wanted it. I was going, yeah. I go and come out with boxes of records to my yeah. car. Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you another little thing, which is an aside, which was they ended it in the 80s. But when you flew, uh, because of the, the, the trade agreements and the import and export duty, you know, England had a severe thing. So did America in the 70s and 80s. I think they 
ended it in the mid to late 80s. But when I first went on my second trip in 1980, I remember when I came back in 79 with all the records, I was charged duty on those records. And then I quickly learned a scam that what you do, you go to the second-hand record store, you fill up your case and your record bag with a pile of crap. And you declare it because you, in those days you had to declare it at the airport before you left that these records are for promotional purposes, you, you're not using them. As soon as you get out to New York, you throw them all away and you fill them with, with new stuff and you take, <laughs> the, take the stickers off. Yep. You, you take the, 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 the price stickers off them plastic, and you come back. Plastic, yep. Yeah, and it, no, you could leave the cellophane on, but you, in those days, I can't, they used to get this little square sticker. It was about an inch square. Um, that used to come on all import records into the UK from America. And you should take them off when you come through customs at Heathrow or wherever. And then you wouldn't have to pay any duty. And that's a scam. You only get hit once and you learn it very quickly. So you learn real went. fast, right? You learn it real <laughs> fast. Yeah. I think they ended that in the, in the, in the early or mid 80s. But, for, you know, because when I was hustling records, I'd bring back, you know, hundreds of cases of records. No clothes, nothing. I just bring back records and sneakers um, and then hawk them around the shops and sell to DJs because that's how I lived. Oh, that's I right. I always tell that story, Jazzy, uh, not Jazzy, uh, Jazzy M. He called yeah, me Jazzy for M. Pumas. Yeah. He needed Pumas in the 80s and I remember yeah. I had to send him yeah. basket Pumas because you couldn't <laughs> get them in the UK. Yeah. I yeah. had to ship them over for him. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. he says, man, I can't get these. I was, and yeah, I came them. over with... with um, uh, um, shell toes, yeah. Uh, it's either shell toes. You know, you guys used to take them. They had them all around around everywhere. everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You make them everywhere. And everywhere. especially kid sizes because they never sold kid sizes of those things in England. So my kids were small then, and I'd bring back. You know, my kids would be doing the school. I'd come back with Nike Jordans when we wouldn't see them in England for a year after they came out. Yeah, I came back with Jordans for my kids. See, that's the luxury that. you had of traveling. You had I that. Know. Luxury. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. You were loathed oh, over it. Well, <laughs> on that note, we're gonna load you right here. We're gonna we're gonna drop you off on the side right now and, and leave the car running and push you out the door because we love you so much. We got your story. Yeah. We got your full story. Well, we got no, you got part of it. It's not the full story. Well, here's, here's the story we got. That's now recap. We got the story that we needed to hear. Yeah. That's still being written. There's yeah. more to come. It's work in progress. There's work in progress. I mean, okay. even with me, I'm doing probably some of my best work I've ever done right now. Mm. And you know what? God knows what's going to happen with you. You may come across something and create something that's so incredible where you go, damn, why didn't I think of it? <laughs> you know, it's like, it just happens, you know. It just happens. It, happens it just happens. happens. It's like kinetic energy, you know. And this is what I've been trying to tell people. Mm. The best thing is, I know people are isolated. Reach out to your loved ones. Check on all your friends. Make yeah. sure everybody's okay because we will get through this together. Wear yeah. your masks. Be vigilant and diligent. Be yeah. smart. Don't listen to everything you hear. Ask mm -hmm. good questions. Mm -hmm. Ask the questions you need to learn to yeah. understand what's going on around you. Don't believe everything you read because it, it, there is something to be said when you make the common yeah, sense. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. Common sense. That's yeah. it. I just want to kick a few shouts to some Good, kick it New out, Yorkers. Kick it out. I mean, um, I, I want to send the most love to uh, Cynthia Cherry. Oh, my God. Where is she? Yeah, I don't know. But <laughs> my sister from New York. Yes, I love her. Cherry. Um, also, Cherry. Paul Simpson, Connection. I haven't seen all. Um, Use me, lose Forrest. me, baby. Yeah, um, Bruce Forrest. These are all old school, obviously. Bruce is um, living in... Um, <laughs> If he's watching, I know Bruce is in Col not Colombia in um mm. in South America with his wife. Yeah, yeah. I haven't reached out to those guys, and those guys have tried to reach out to me, but I've been useless and lazy. And whenever they've contacted me, I've had other things going on in my life, which meant I couldn't get my head around dealing with it. So I I apologize online to 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 Aww. the guys who reached out to me, and I I haven't. But oh yeah, the other club would have been better days that you would have went to. Yeah, better days. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Thank, thank goodness you know. Um, I remember how to think for a minute. I said, better days <laughs> is going on. Because that's yeah. after T. Scott was fired, Bruce took his. Yeah. He was fired. He was hired as the, yeah. the DJ. Yeah. So, and Timmy yeah. Reddisburg came out of there too. So a lot of mm. good talent. Robert Covillis. Yeah. David Cole, yeah. the keyboard player. Mm. And I went to a few one off places 
in the meatpacking district. There, I, there used to be a night there that I actually played there. My first proper club gig was there. I want to kick a shout to all the guys who run Giant Step. The Giant Step guys, I used to play for them. Um, turntables on the Hudson. I played on the boat there. That was uh, amazing. And I'm trying to think of the club that I played. I did a party for ID magazine, the ID World Tour. I mean, I was beside myself, had to pick myself off the floor when they said, Norman Jay, we want you to do our New York party. And that's the one and only time I was ever nervous at a gig. I'm never phased or anything. But at this gig, it was a fashion party for um, ID. And the only person who was missing that night was Larry Levan. But everybody came. Um, Tony Humphreys uh, came. Uh, um, Frankie Knuckles came. <laughs> Everyone who was anyone <laughs> came to support me that night. I was so nervous. All my peers, all my heroes in the room. And I had to quickly compose myself and think, don't get, do what you do. Don't try and impress this, what the people in front of you. So after about 10 or 15 minutes, I was able to relax and I just played. And every turn they kept coming and going, you've got this tune on the 12 inch. Where did you find this? How do you know about this? That's all I was getting all night. Yeah, I just that's what happens. Because that's what we all do. We train spot all night. We all do that. Yeah. <laughs> We're good for that. I'm good for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right yeah. Going, yeah, yeah. What was that? Yeah. And, and it was great. And it really put me at my ease. And, you know, um, and subsequent, in subsequent years, I've come back and done, you know, small one-offs. But I haven't done a proper gig in New York, I don't know, for about 15, probably 20 years. A long time. Um, we need you back. We yeah. And that, no, what am I talking No, Last time I played was at, at Cielo about 10, 12 years ago for Martin Luther King. It was for a Martin Luther King night. Um, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. And even as a DJ, I only ever toured America once. And I told my agent, I don't want to do it again. I hated it. <laughs> but I don't want to leave it on a sour note. And uh, New York, I well, love. Tell us why you hated it now that you... That, that, that you I hated it because, um, you know, as people were telling me, you have to spend... I was away from my family for a couple of months. I was on the road. I loved the people that I met in the clubs. Um, I loved all the promoters and the fans who turned out to, 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 to hear me and support me. But flying from one city to another every time you know i was dealing with um, racist airline officials um security people who kept um pulling me over every time searching all my bags searching all my records finding me i realized that was a scam um and i didn't really enjoy it and i remember going to my new york agent no if i come to america again it's only to play in either new york or san francisco I loved. Those were the two I, I loved, and I did a tremendous night in Seattle and in Atlanta. But other than that, um, no, I did, it wasn't something I wanted to repeat. Didn't want to do it again. So, could you ever imagine that it's so friggin' racist like this? Yeah. The well, no. It, but I, I wasn't surprised. America has a history. I'm well versed with American history. You know, I wasn't surprised or, or put out. But it was just the fact that. Uh, you know, because I was on my own. Maybe I was a little bit homesick and I'd never traveled until that tour. I'd only ever been to New York and L.A. I'd never been to America, Heartland. You know, I went yeah. to Minneapolis. I went to um, Denver. Uh, I went to um, New Orleans. I went to places in Georgia. And all of this happened because, you know, it, I had a following you know, on the internet. And the early days of the internet, I never knew. But I remember my New York agent, Kim, was showing me, she, she managed to put a tour together for me based on the fact that I had these people listening to my Radio London shows around the world. So the tour came really because out, out of that, you know, some gigs, you know, all small clubs, bars, you know, 100, 150 people, 200 people max, small places. But th th they were heads you know, who was really into what I was doing and, and the stuff I was playing, you know, giving them an education in their own history. <laughs> it was mad. Wow, incredible. Incredible. Great. Mm. See, I said, now, I hope, again, here we go. Yeah, another piece of the, of the pie comes out. Here we go. And then the ingredients, unbelievable. But when you, Lenny, um, did spread love, I said, 
I've got to have this tune. I played it and I, I tell you, I'm one of those who's responsible for breaking that record. I know you are. I, I knew the, the original and I even put it on one of my good times comps. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> and let me clarify that to everybody. <laughs> So I'm in the middle of the West End and I'm walking one way, like it looks like like um, a Western film. I'm walking down one road and here comes another man. His name is yeah. Norman Jay. And yeah. I scream out, Norman! And he turns <laughs> and goes, hey, Lenny! I swear, <laughs> I went running and I just stopped and I hugged him and I said, thank you. For mm. what? Mm. I said, you, you, you rocked my spread love. He says, man, I would have did that regardless. I said, that's <laughs> not it. Mm. I knew you were playing it. It was everybody, everywhere I went, I heard that, you know Norman Jay's is playing your record? You know Norman Jay's playing your record? No, I'm talking about that time when I just, I just had just finished it. I know you said, and BMG is re-releasing it, Mm. believe it or not. They're getting ready to re-release it. And Defected, we uh, put it on a compilation not too long ago. And that was another big record again. So Mm. it's funny how these old tracks that I touched from back then are resurfacing again. Yeah, for a new generation. Thanks to DJs like Melvo. <laughs> yeah, Melvo's rocking. Yeah, Melvo's rocking it hard. I mean, I give Melvo tons of credit. Mm. I mean, you taught him well, mate. You said yeah. you definitely lay laws down that need to be and boots to be filled. Yeah, each one teach one. That's right. Keep mm. keep. You know, I always said keep keep it going, keep it moving. Mm. Everyone, please thank you so much for. I mean, you spent a long time with us. Oh my God, almost three hours. Great time. Time well spent. Oh my God, I'm so happy. I, I, I felt like I went out, had dinner. I felt like I had to this and I just haven't left my, my camera. And people have been just enjoying and engrossed in all everything. Well, I, thank, I thank each and every one for logging in, for checking in, for supporting what you're doing. Long may it continue. And, and, and I'm hoping we get this podcast because I think mm. this is going to, I think. I have a feeling this is going to go somewhere, this True House mm. Stories. It needed to be done. There was a void. Everyone's playing music, which I love to do. But I yeah. really think we need to hear the selectors tell us the stories. Mm. Yeah. You know, the hardships, mm. the rise to fame. You know, there's also been the rise to fame and also the mm. drop off to the fall. Yeah. You know, it all comes with both. And how, yeah. you know, Quincy Jones says, it's not the peaks, everybody. It's yeah. how you live in the valley. Yeah. And that's the part. How long can you get out of the valley mm. you know it's not uh, life is not all peaks yeah a lot of valleys involved so we've all learned and we've all been t- tried and tested and true house stories will keep telling us and telling everyone these stories each and every week yeah. and thank you again norman jack can't thank you enough and please be safe i doff my hat to you same it's great to, to be you, in the presence of greatness thanks lenny oh my god thank you so much and <laughs> and uh Again, thank you to you too, and have a good evening. And I hope to see you soon. And mm-hmm. Godspeed to us getting a vaccination or whatever this thing yeah, does. Yeah. Let's yeah. just get out of this. Yeah. I Everyone, see. you can always send your fan letters, write them pen and paper to Norman J. Because he doesn't <laughs> like to read the internet. He would rather <laughs> see the mail in paper. No, I, 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 do, I do have a Facebook and I do have a Twitter. And a, what's the other one with the photographs? Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> You can, you can find you can find me there. I occasionally um, pass through those things, but um, you know, uh, it is what it is. It is what it is, and I've just got to deal with it the way it is. One last question: mm-hmm. vinyl or digital for you? Um, vinyl at home, digital when I'm working. Got you. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that's. I think people, we've covered everything. Have a great night, Mr. Norman J. Thank you again. I, you. I we Definitely. ended here. Ta-ta for now. See you on the other side, mate. Have a good one. Thank Thank you. Thanks to Sharon for hooking me up as well. Oh, yes. Mm. Yes. And Ken, no, Karen. Karen. Oh, Karen. Beg your pardon. Sharon sounded good, too, because we could have said, thank you, Sharon. Karen. Maybe you are. Yes. Yes. Karen works harder for us. She's amazing, Karen. She's incredible. Karen, wherever you are, thank you again for sharing and working this to death. Good night, Mr. Take care, everyone. See you all next week. Same place, same time, same channel. Cheers. All right, Lenny. All good.